return us to open session. And just to remind everyone that agendas and the sign-up sheets for public comment are on the tables uh, outside the entrances to this room. This is where you can also find a copy of the bylaw related to public comment. And so if you wish to address the board on an agenda item, you need to sign in before we get to item three because the sign-up sheets will be collected at that time just for agenda items only. Uh, you'll still be able to sign up throughout the meeting if you wish to address the board when we get to item nine on any topic. Uh, additional sign-up sheets will be available at those tables throughout the meeting. Speakers will be limited to those who follow our correct procedure, so please fill out the sign-up sheet as directed, and we'll begin the meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. Mrs. McLean, may I have a roll call, please? Here. Mrs. Brady? Here. Mr. Hyatt? Here. Mr. Catalina? Here. Mrs. McGinnis? Here. Mr. Heath? Here. Mrs. Wilson? Here. This meeting is a meeting of the Board of Education in public for the purpose of conducting the school district's business and is not to be considered a public community hearing. There is time for public participation during the meeting is indicated in agenda items three and nine. Item two is approval of the consent agenda. May I have a motion, please? I move that the Board of Education approves the consent, uh, consent agenda as presented. Support. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Item three is citizens' request to address the board. You are given two opportunities to address the board. Under item 3.1, you can request to address the board about any topic that's on tonight's agenda. Or under item nine, you are welcome to address the board on any topic. When making comments, please state your name and address. Direct your comments to Mrs. Kelly Horst, president. Each person may speak for up, up to two minutes. Per established procedures, the board will not respond to questions or interact with the speaker during public comment. And so while additional sign-up sheets are being retrieved, let me reiterate that calling out individuals in this forum is inappropriate and personal attacks will not be tolerated. Anyone who engages in criticism and or a personal attack of an individual, whether by name or other identification, will be stopped and prevented from doing so. Please keep your remarks and your attention directed to the full board. And as a reminder, we have two microphones in the auditorium tonight. One is right down here up front. And there's another one in the back uh, at the lower level of, of the, I guess, middle, the mezzanine, the middle balcony there. And I know Mrs. McLean already brought me one sheet. Let me give her just a minute to retrieve a second sheet. And we'll make sure that uh, if we have any citizens who wish to address us on an agenda item, I can note that before we continue on with the meeting. But just a reminder that there will still be sign-up sheets available if you wish to um, sign up to address the board on any topic at all. You may do that throughout the meeting, and uh, that will be when we get to item nine. Thank you so much. Mr. Whittington, where are you? I don't have a topic here, so I don't know if you are interested in an agenda item or just a general statement. Okay. Uh, we'll move on with item four, our superintendent update, Dr. Ryan. Thank you, President Horst. Good evening, community. Appreciate your attendance at our meeting tonight. I have a lot of good things to share that are going on in Clarkston right now. And I'll start with my COVID report. Um, over the last several weeks from the start of the school year, we started with the efforts, although we attempted to go through um, from last year in a way that we could have as much normalcy as possible within our district to start this school year. And we did have cases that numbered between 25 and 35 for the first couple week of weeks of school. I'm happy to report over the last two weeks, the number of cases has dropped an average of 12 active cases district wide right now, which is a very good number in terms of the overall um, representation, the spread of COVID in Clarkston. We're hoping to stay at that margin or go down. 
All trends right now that I see nationally seem to suggest that right now the current wave seems to be subsiding and heading back down. We're hoping that holds through and continues into the fall for Clarkson Community Schools, but we're going to continue to monitor and, and watch that and report that both on our website and upcoming board meetings so that our community has a good sense of where we're at with respect to COVID. Um, in very exciting news over compared to the last couple years, looking at our fall sports teams. You know, I'm happy to report that our football, volleyball, and soccer are all heading on to the district tournaments in the next two weeks. And our cross country team will be completing its last tournament of the regular season this weekend before heading on to regionals. And over the weekend, Clarkson High School Marching Band competed in the Novi Fanfare and placed third in their flight of the Southeast Michigan bands. So both in music and athletics, <laughs> it's been great to see. In a personal grudge with our Lake Warrior counterparts of uh, betting for a parking spot at our next superintendent's meeting, Clarkston came victorious 50 to 22 over Lake Orion, which is always nice every year to kind of put in the Clarkston basket. Additionally, this week, we see excitement in the halls of our secondary buildings with respect to Spirit Weeks. Students are dressing up, taking part in different spirit activities, including this evening, if you notice the parking lot being kind of full. It's we have our yearly Powder Puff football game, which has been in as long as I've been in Clarkston, one of the great traditions between the junior and senior class. I'm hoping before the end of the meeting to be able to provide an update if the senior class is going to be victorious again. I don't see any of our high school uh, administrators who are out there, but be able to report on that as well. Um, this Friday will be the Clarkston homecoming game. I'm hoping that all of you take a personal invite if you can make it. Uh, it's a great time to get that Clarkson traditions of seeing five, six, seven thousand people getting together for a football game on a Friday night. It's really a community affair. And then our homecoming dance will be Saturday night. And yours truly, his daughter, who ninth grade, a little bit seeing my daughter grow up, will be attending your first homecoming dance. So it's a little bit personal as well. Uh, last week, we participated in our elementary programs of having our, our national walk to school day. And I had the honor of kind of leading with some of our marching band to actually participate in these walks to school. I've seen Mr. Adams and Michelle Shan uh, as we kind of uh, shut down some roads for a little while as, as our kids had an opportunity to walk in school and promotion of health, fitness, and overall movement and activity, which I appreciate our principals for helping to participate in. Uh, everybody should know that October is National Principals Month. We celebrate it every October. Our principals are really the lever, really help support our school district in making it happen in every day with the wonderful teaching staff that we have. And I want to give my nod, and if you have an opportunity over the next couple weeks to send a note, acknowledge, or to, to have a couple words with your principal to show some appreciation, Clarkson does an amazing job, principals, and I just want to salute you guys in the crowd. Thank you for everything that you guys do, including being here this evening. Thank you. I also want to kind of report as, as I've been around to buildings and talking to teachers over the last several weeks, and I got to share some time with the Andersonville Elementary staff this morning, and their kindergarten teachers want to know, there they are in the back, please, a little noise, I thank you guys this morning for that wonderful reception. And to see that all the hard work that's going on in the classrooms, our teachers want you to know that they have this, it's under control with respect to post-pandemic, or at least where we are within, in trying to pull back to some level of normalcy in Clarkston and in our classrooms, they are making headway. They are making gains. They want you to know that it's not easy, that over the last year, not only have there been challenges in, in academic gains that they're helping to mitigate and to bring together, but of students as they come back when they were used to maybe learning off a screen or in another format to be back in a classroom. You know, we have students that hadn't literally been in a classroom uh, starting first and second grade to have that in-class experience with other kids. So I really want to say a shout out to obviously our Andersonville teachers, but all the teachers at Clarkson for all the efforts they're doing to really make it for our students that are coming back in the classrooms and everything you're doing as we go into this fall. Um, it's nice to feel a sense of normalcy, as best we're defined as we move into complete normalcy of what you're doing and the excellence that you're bringing to the classroom. So thank you, and especially those that have come out tonight. Thank you as well. Finally tonight, we have some very good information, uh, presentations for our community tonight. In the areas of special education, you're going to get to see an overall um, kind of survey and understanding of the aspects of the Clarkson Special Education and Support Division, what they're up against, what they're doing, and how they're making all students 
a success in Clarkston. You're also going to get a peek and a, and a starting look at an update as we do our facilities review. Obviously, as administrators, school board, and as a community, we have to be stewards of our school district and our facilities, and it's a constant job to keep up with those and making sure that where we are at a point in time that we're not only great right now for the kids of Clarkston, but we need to be prepared to be able to hand that on for the kids of Clarkston in the future, and the future community to keep this community strong and what it's been and what it can be and what it's going to be moving forward. So I'm really proud of that. Finally, you're going to hear an aspect of Clarkston's career tech education which traditionally back when I was in school, we had shop classes, for those of you guys in, in my age demographic can remember. Now we've really kind of turned the page, moving into real vocational preparations, not only in, in the areas of construction, which is no longer kind of expansion from what shop used to be. We're literally building houses and teaching skills for students to go out into the workforce, and we want to keep expanding that. But other areas of high tech, computer science and other areas that students can move on to college, the military, or on to other training so they can be all they can be moving forward from Clarkson schools. So we want to give you a collective update and to hear some of the great things, what we're doing now and what we plan to do into the future this evening. So thank you, President Horse. Many different areas to be proud of tonight. All right, thank you, Dr. Ryan. Uh, as he said, we have two presentation items tonight. We'll begin with 5.1, uh, Mr. Conwell our K-12 Career Awareness and Readiness Update. First of all, I'd like to thank you for uh, allowing me to speak to all of you tonight. And um, I appreciate the work that Dr. Ryan and Nancy Mahoney have done in leading us into a position where our district was ready to take on this Career Ready initiative, and I think you'll see that in our first slide. Can you all hear me all right? Okay. If I can get the next slide. Clicker. Oh, there we go. So it's important that we start with a foundation of a mission and a vision, and that mission and vision gives us the direction that will allow us to take on the responsibility of making sure that the students that we commence and graduate are prepared for life. And when we got the four pillars, uh, when we were talking and we developed them, I personally was extremely excited uh, with the future pathways as an area that I could focus on and make sure that we impacted every student um, I am a Clarkston High School graduate, 1986. Uh, I spent six years in the Clarkston School District. I spent my whole childhood in this community. But I did not come back directly to education. Uh, I had a career as an Army officer. I served in Saudi Arabia. I served in the Republic of Korea. And I served here in the States. I also was a quality engineer. I made decisions about whether or not uh, we would take a certain path in a foreign country with millions of dollars of military equipment. I made decisions about whether or not a battery that was exploding was something that should be recalled for a medical company. I came back to Clarkston, and when I came back to Clarkston, I ran the transportation uh, department for a year. Mm -hmm. So I've had a lot of different careers. I've had a lot of different jobs. And it's fitting that this excites me and that I've been given the opportunity to take that broad background and then make sure that we give every student an understanding that there is more than one path to success. There is one, and there is more than one movement that you will make in your life. You will probably do more than one thing. If we can prepare them for that key analysis, for that key understanding of themselves, well, we're going to be successful in commencing students into life. The way that we do that, and I want to thank Oakland Schools for championing and, and giving us a, a very nice template that we could develop. Uh, I did not come up with soda, but I fully embrace soda, not only as the drink, but as you can see here, as the, uh, a way, an acronym that we can use to really understand how do we approach every student 
in this large educational organization and make sure that we're taking care of all of them in these key areas. And as you can see that the S is for self-awareness. It is a critical component of our educational institutions that we make our students aware of the gifts and talents that they have as they go through the educational process. Those gifts and talents are going to give them a perspective and a confidence that we hope will matriculate towards a plan that they can put into place and a realization that that plan may not survive first contact and that's okay but they have the skills to absorb the changes. So as we take them through the educational process, we want to identify those skills. And when we identify those skills, we want to tie them to potential careers. You're very good at this, and people that are good at this do this for a living. That's a very important thing to say to a student so that they can start to see themselves in these roles. The options portion is also very critical because a lot of students, just like myself, uh, my father was a foreman in the plant, Pontiac Motors, back before it closed, and my mother was a teacher here in Clarkston schools, not while I was in Clarkston schools, but shortly after. And uh, if those were the influences I had in life, that would not be bad. But that's not all of the options that are out there. The options of a quality engineer were never presented to me, yet I served as one. The option of a military officer was nothing that anyone in my family had ever done before my older brother, but that was an influencer where I understood that option was available. The option of becoming a teacher is something that I fell into later in life, but that I learned from my mother. So, if we're going to make sure students understand all of those options and take the one that's best for them, it's a very critical component of our educational system that we ensure that those options don't come accidentally. They have to be, they have to be intentional. In the next tier of area, when we get into the secondary portion of a student's education, we want to give the, get them involved in decision making. We, we want that decision making to be something that's grounded in self-awareness and an understanding of options. And once they have that, give them the power to make decisions and communicate to them the importance of those decisions in their education. When they take electives, take those electives based off of an understanding of the skills that they have about the options of careers that are out there so that they can start to investigate a little bit further, is this thing that I'm excited about something I could really do? And as they take those next courses and that becomes confirmed, then we want them to be able to take action. We want to push our students to be able to say, I went out and had a work experience in this area. So that when I cross that stage and I get that diploma and I commence into my life, I know that when I go to that post-secondary institution, when I go to get that certi certification, when I go to that union shop, that I've experienced this and I'm excited about it and I'm good at it. That changes a lot of things from the perspective of a student that's walking across that stage and saying, I just don't know what's next. We have to be determined to have no students walk across the stage saying, I don't know what's next. Have a plan, be willing to push through that plan until the plan needs to change, but you've got the power to do so. Oh, that just turned off on me. Oh, there we go. So some key questions that we should ask ourselves is, what does a career-ready graduate look like? And I think as I went through the SOTA uh, acronym, you can see a little bit about what that graduate looks like. And these statements here are very important for us to keep in mind. We want them to be self-aware. We want them to know their options. We want them to have the ability to make decisions informed and then we want them to be empowered to act. How do we ensure that every student is career ready? Uh, I think the biggest thing that we have to do is move beyond accidental to intentional. And that's why this system is very important. 
if we don't have a system report uh, in place that says we're interested in understanding what we're doing that influences the students and then understanding to what degree they've been influenced, then everything that's happening is incidental or accidental. And I don't think that that's an appropriate way that we should approach it. So the intentional acts of making sure that we are linking their self-awareness to the options that are out there um, is that critical first step and we're concentrating on that at the elementary level. And then that could continue through their junior high and high school levels, but we're hoping at a diminished rate because they're starting to take actions and they're starting to explore um, and making decisions about that education. But as you make a decision, if you have to make a change, you may have to go back to explore. You may have to go back and find something else you're good at. So we don't want to lock them in at any given time. We want to make sure they understand that the plan is theirs. Empower them to make sure that they go through that process over and again throughout their life. I know that I've executed that plan later in life than many have and have ended up with successful situations. So I think it's a good skill that we would be passing on. You have to forgive me, my, this clicker is not responding for me. Thank you. So what will students use? And I think the great news is that we, although this plan and this process is something that we've introduced, and I think that we've introduced it well, it, it's, a, it's built off of a solid foundation of things that we have been doing. It's just a more intentional process that we're going to in, uh, engage in. And if you look at uh, Zello, if we could link over to that. Zello is our way to produce an EDP for every student. The great news here is that it's electronic. It is something that the students can maintain uh, even after graduation for a period of time. It's a way for us to make sure that students have the ability to explore those career options, record that information, reflect on it when they're planning out their schedules, share it with their parents when those schedules are produced and when we're thinking about post-secondary options. And it's also something they could carry forward as a repository for their experiences. If they do something great in a classroom, a, a project that they think would encourage their employers, potential employers to hire them, they have a place to put it. As they develop their resume, they have a place that they can put it and they can always get back to it because it's electronically accessed. So this is a great tool. NEPRIS is a way for us to link ourselves to professionals both here locally and across the country. NEPRIS is an organization that if we call them up and say, we would really like to have someone come in and speak to our physics students about what does a physics um, major do with that understanding in the career world and have that professional share with them, these are the different things that they've done in their life and, and these are the important skills that allowed them to take what they did in the academic setting and then put it towards their career success. And that can all be done by NEPRIS. The teacher doesn't have to spend the time looking for that professional. NEPRIS will vet them. NEPRIS will make sure that uh, they're ready to go on that time frame. They'll set up the communication. A great benefit, I know it's hard to see benefits when we think about the pandemic, but a great benefit that we took out of this pandemic is that we can connect and we can communicate through our technology far flung and we can do it very successfully. Meetings can be done. It's not optimal for all levels of education. It's not optimal uh, even in most settings for education, but it is a necessity if we're going to fully take advantage of education in a distributed world. So NEPRIS gives us that power. I think it's a great tool and we have it at our fingertips already. The training and then the implementation of that is something that we've been working on last year and will be continuing on in years to come. Career days are something that we have done and uh, we've done them at different elementaries at different times. We've done them very well at the Sashaball Middle School and the junior high and here at the high school. 
what I want to do with the career days is, is focus them and make sure that they're an institutional thing that we look forward to, that we engage our community in, that they're aware of it, that they have a way for us to work with them to make sure that their voices are heard. We have a huge experience in the workforce right here in our community. The professionals that work in our community love our children and they also do great work. And if we can share that with our students, we can cross fertilize those things so that some teachers can talk to students whose parents aren't teachers and some engineers whose can talk to students whose parents are not engineers. And now we get the options spread out there. So these career days are critical. We can leverage NEPRIS also to introduce some careers that may not be represented in our area. But if we intentionally go to our students and say, what is it that you're interested in now? And then take that list and see what, who in our community can speak to our students about that. And then if we don't have it in the community, go to NEPRIS and say, Let's set up something virtual. Now these career days are gonna be differentiated for all students, and all students are gonna gain from it. So we have a great foundation, but we have tools that we can advance it, and that's what I'm looking forward to doing. We also have the ability, I think, within our community to do job shadows. This is something that we can work forward with as students get to that part when they want to act. And with a strong community of businesses that are out there that could absorb a student coming in and job shadowing or interning, that would really confirm or deny for a student a thoughtful passion they might have about working in that area. It is not necessarily a loss if they go into that experience and find out this is not the job for me. That's probably a gain of a lot of college credits if that career costs money in order to advance to a college diploma. So every one of those potential job shadows or industry partnerships will reflect a great learning for the student, either denying a suspicion or absolutely engaging them in what I want to become in the future. We do have career and technical education opportunities, and this is linked to this whole career readiness concept. We will respond to what the labor statistics say are the highest paying and highest in demand um, positions available. And we will provide educators that have experience in those areas to reach out to our students and give them that high school experience that'll help them move forward. And we have strong capabilities already of doing the job shadows at the, as the capstone of these courses. But we don't represent all of the different fields of study that are out there. We also have our partner OSTC who assists us in some of those other areas and, and they can fill in some of those blanks. But even beyond that, uh, we have to be prepared as we move forward to always reflect our community's needs. And as we look at the returns of reaching out to the community and the students and finding out what it is that they really want to look at for a career option, if we are intentional, we can know five to 10 years out, hey, this class is really, really wanting to explore this area and we're not prepared right now to get that done. And we'll have time to make sure that we have the opportunities for them once they get to that part of prior to commencement being able to act. I do wanna bring up uh, an EDP example here. Uh, this is a redacted example of an EDP, so this is a student's EDP, but the name is not shared. And as you can see, there's a lot of information and exploration that can be done by a student. Down at the bottom is the repository of what that student could put in. We want to make this a richer engagement. And that takes intentional practice of all core curriculum areas and electives, understanding that as a student does something, that speaks to their talents, let's get that recorded into their account so that when they start developing resumes and they develop a way to communicate with a potential employer, their skills are not washed over. So how are we gonna do this? Uh, I think that the most uh, 
intelligent way to approach anything is you have to assess it first. So we've developed a team, and uh, that team has some defined members. We'll be meeting next Friday, not this coming Friday, but next, to start talking about how it is that we're going to assess. That assessment has to be data-driven. It, it can't be anecdotal. Uh, an anecdotal uh, response is only going to touch a certain number of students. It's when we get that full response from all students and hopefully from teachers and community members that we fully understand where we're at. And once we assess where we're at, then we analyze that assessed data, come up with an action plan. We've got a good foundation. We've got things that we're going to do. But how are we going to fine tune that? Where are the special needs that we need to focus on? What are some ideas that we could implement? Because if you implement an idea without having a way to see if that idea actually was successful, then you're going to end up with something that you may feel good about, but that really wasn't productive. We don't want to just feel good about this. We want to make sure that every student gets something out of it. And then finally, after we push those implementations through, we have to assess again. And it just becomes a process. And hopefully this becomes something that's part of our cultural norm, part of our TLC, as we come back year after year and say, this is where we're at with career, career readiness right now. This is the initiative that we took on last year. This is what we saw in data. This is what we saw and analyzed in data that tells us we should do something different. And here's the plan to do that and then we just keep on moving. The task force members are written there for you. I want to especially thank Nancy for working with me to get this started, and then all of the counselors and uh, secondary principals who have agreed to work with me to make this assessment process work for all students. So the last thing we want to do is assure that the focus is student and outcomes um, based. And the only way that we can do that is by looking at what we expect to hear back from students. So when we created these documents that I shared with you on the assessment piece, I know they're long and wordy. The reason that they are is that we've thought about the critical things that we need to hear back from students. We need to hear assurances, yes, I feel like I'm career ready. Yes, I've got a plan. And we're only going to get that understanding from them if we ask them. And that, that's the first part. The second part is reacting to their answer. So we can assure that this is really focused on our students if we take this approach. And with that, I'd like to open it up if you have any questions as board members or if you have any comments on what you just saw, I would welcome them at this time. Thank you so much, Mr. Conwell. Trustees, what questions or comments do you have? Mrs. McGinnis? Thank you for your presentation. I think it's fabulous to um, work through intention with our students and not just assume these pathways get created in every family and every household. We often wonder um, why kids aren't taking certain advanced classes. And a lot of it is because maybe they're not getting the feedback at home Maybe they're not getting the feedback in class. Maybe the feedback that they're getting is not as direct as it needs to be. Mm -hmm. And so I really appreciate this process. Um, here's a couple questions I have. Um, do you have a tool that will analyze the data or is it gonna be subjective to the members of the committee? Well, we have a tool of understanding what we're looking for, but we're going to be developing that assessment tool, not only here locally, but Oakland Schools, who has a very similar program, has pushed this out to all Oakland County schools. Okay. So when I go to those meetings at Oakland Schools, I'm looking for their leadership and help in finding the successful questions and tools that they used to get the information back um, and from our um, fellow districts across the county. And uh, I think in the end, it will take a few years to get a really robust tool but I don't think we should always rely on that because as times change, that tool needs to be updated. So we should always be looking for how can we make this better. The, the key members we have on that team to help develop our first instance of this, I'm very confident in. Mm -hmm. 
uh, going forward, we'll just continue to work with everybody that we can to make sure that it's enriched as much as possible. And I agree with you. I do see the potential that the tool will need to be tweaked mm -hmm. on a yearly basis because the job of tomorrow is not known. Exactly. And therefore, the career for that job is not known. Um, there is going to be some baseline um, decision-making skills that our students will need to have to make some of those, to, to conjure up the job that is not yet known. Sure. And I'm sure that those will be some of the baseline data that you use to make those kind of decisions. Where do you see the assessment happening in the school day? Do you have a thought yet? Is it going to be in a language art class? Is it going to be in homeroom time? Um, and, and wherever it is, is your consideration that this teacher that's prepping them for the assessment will become a trainer or be trained within this process also? Uh, yes to all of those different instances. I would love to see it in all of those areas. Okay. And absolutely yes in the training portion. And I think that's why it's so critical and wonderful that when I spoke to the secondary division and the elementary division, uh, to an administrator, they were excited. And when we talked about opening up a team, they all signed up. That gives me great confidence that we're going to have success. If I do not have the buy-in of the administrators and eventually the teachers, this is not going to go anywhere. Mm -hmm. So I think that making sure that we understand where we're at right now, we're at the infancy of what we want to get done, and uh, we will find the smartest and best way to implement that in the classrooms where it dovetails best with the lessons that are being taught. But to restrict it to one currently, I don't think I'm prepared to do so. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So I, I wonder, in its early infancy, how many responses from our students will be, uh, I don't know. Yes, I do too. And I, I, I think it's going to be high. Uh, just off of my experience with my own kids. Now, you mm -hmm. would think, here's the guy that's supposed to be talking to you about careers. I tried to influence my son and daughter on what careers they would have. And I even, with my wife's magic, helped my son make sure that he was scheduled for all of my classes. Right. But in the end, he went uh, in for physical therapist, which is nothing that I teach. I teach computer science area. Mm -hmm. Now, the, I guess, uh, karma or the end effect was the left physical therapy after the first semester and went back to information technology and project management. So, um, and that just goes to the fluidity of understanding that you right. have some desires and he thought he was interested in something and found out that he wasn't. Right, and, and I think in your house, so that, that example is, it holds very true to good many of our kids, sure. but, it, yeah. but in those students' households who don't get that feedback, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know response is still an okay response because you're yep. putting them in a place where you're asking them to think about and set goals that somebody is going to ask them to work to attain. And I think that there's a, a lot of our students that may not yet be at that place mm -hmm. where they have really put down on a piece of paper, here's what I think I want to do when I graduate, when I walk across that stage, or where I think I want to go. So I'm really looking forward to the potentials of what this program can do for a lot of those kids who are in that I don't know stage, and, and, and those who think they already know too. Right, so and you. I think that what's really great about that is as we empower them each time we ask them by saying, do you want to change that, that's going to get them into the mindset that this is not something that I have to have fear about. Right. This is something that I should be excited about and that I should fully explore and be empowered with. And rejecting a future career is not you saying I'm not capable of that. It's you saying I'm not interested in that. And what I'm more capable in is something else. Mm -hmm. And if we can properly communicate to, that our, to, to our students, we're going to graduate confident students who have a plan and understand that that plan is theirs and that they have the power to change it if they need to. Yeah, no right or wrong answer. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you for the question. Well, You're welcome. Mr. Hart. I, I really enjoyed um, what you brought to us here today. I think there are some students, I'd say very few students, are sort of seemingly born with a plan. Right. Um, but very few plans actually go in a straight line, and increasingly so. I mean, your, your own story is, is um, I think, quintessential these days of there are a lot of career changes, a lot of different options available. 
And, and, and I know a lot of our students don't know what those are. They haven't been exposed to them. Whatever their parents do, are doing is what they're exposed to. Right. And, and maybe teaching because they're in school and they see teachers and sure. you know, very other limited careers. Um, certainly um, taking all kids where they are and, and some of them are very advanced in, in the area of knowing what their future might hold and what options are and, and, and some are, are you know, maybe less aware um, but this framework really takes them all and moves them all up, right. which I think is, is really helpful because, you know, we don't want to add something that burdens students that already have a plan. But even if you have a plan, connecting with professionals in your area, you know, experiencing an internship or, you know, going to that next level where, you know, some students may be um, just trying to understand what options are out there. And depending right. on the grade level, I mean, this is a, a K-12, you know, framework that you're sharing. I think it's great to get the right appropriate components to the students at the right time as, as they evolve. And I think you know, our, our vision of having students um, feel like they can achieve their dreams, you have to have a dream. Um, and this is really a component, I think, of, of painting what that future might look like because certainly um, when you're looking for, toward the future, you have some goals. You're making better decisions now if you know what your future might hold. And I think this is phenomenal. I'm, I'm very impressed with how far it's evolved you know, really in the last even decade, um, you know, from where this kind of used to be. Um, Thank so you for your comments. Today. Yep, so appreciate I, it. I, I know this is a lot of effort because it's, it's you, you know, getting a group of people together and trying to push something through a whole school system, mm -hmm. right? And, and that's a little bit pushing things uphill because everybody's doing their own thing in their own area. Right. And so really integrating that, which, you know, to get we can't just continue to add things, right? We have to integrate things to, to make them be successful is what we're, we're learning as we go. And I think I uh, applaud the effort of you and, and the task force you put together. And I look forward to continuing to work on this um, with you over the next probably several years until, we, we, uh, until it's just the way. Right, appreciate that, thank you. Anyone on this end of the table, questions, comments? I really just see this as one more way that we're accountable to our community, really. I mean, you know, the, the conversation of how do we know we're a successful school district. Um, mm -hmm. It's not just the data and the test taking um, that, you know, has been sort of the, the way for so many years. But, um, but you know, how do we know we, we put out successful students? And, um, you know, when you talk about our, our vision and, and do students know where they want to go when they cross the stage? I thought that was really a, a good picture that you painted as, as you spoke. And I think about my own two who are now in college, and one kind of knew what he wanted to do when he got to college, and, and one didn't. And I think colleges put a lot of pressure on our students to choose a major and to have a path. And, and, uh, and so when I started to read this, I thought, ooh, are we, gonna, are we gonna be putting that kind of pressure on kids? But the more I sat with it and the more I read it and some conversation that we had today by email really reassured me that that's not what we're talking about here. It really is more just getting to know their skills, their competencies, their passions, and, and developing ideas and making connections from there. And right. I think, um, you know, I think we owe that to our community to, to, to demonstrate that we're doing what we say we're doing in terms of prepared students who have that sense of self and that confidence to, to know where they're going to go when they, when they leave us. And so it isn't just about college, it isn't just about the workforce, but it is that sense of self in that plan. So, I mean, I thought this was a, a, a terrific step and I know it's a ton of work and I know it really is kind of in its infancy in terms of, of this whole approach. And I thank you for coming tonight and sharing it with yeah, us. Thank you for your comments, appreciate it. All right, wake the computer back up and we'll move on to our second presentation tonight. Item 5.2 is our special education update. Stacey Theophilus, our new special education director, we have been eager to hear from you. Good evening. Good evening, welcome. Hello, um, President Horst, school board, Dr. Ryan, and the community. Um, my name is Stacey Theophilus, and I am the new executive director of student support services with which yes, in other places, we would say the special education department. Right, um, and so I am really excited to be here today um, and since beginning the role at the end of June, I have been incredibly impressed and amazed by the, by the wonderful families, community members, students, and staff that I've been engaging with, and I couldn't be more thrilled to be a part of this amazing community. So tonight we're going to talk about a few things. Um, I'm going to provide you with some information regarding the Department of Student Services 
how are we aligned with the strategic plan. We've also done some surveys of both families and staff. And then we're going to talk about 21-22 updates and next steps as we move through the school year. So who is or who are we? The Department of Student Support Services. So overall, we are currently servicing um, 1,184 students with IEPs and IFSPs. IEPs are individualized education plans. Um, and that is students um, age three through 26. Um, and then also individualized family service plans, which are for our babies, so little IEPs for babies, so birth through three. Um, so that's a piece that, you know, I don't know that everyone is aware of, that we actually do provide special education supports and services for students from birth all the way up through age 26. Um, so early intervention, IFSPs, again, is there. We provide services and supports to preschoolers ages three to five. We have both elementary and secondary, kindergarten through 12th grade, as well as post-secondary and adult transition programming. So current staff that are directly supporting students, so this was as of this past week, um, we have 86 special education teachers. 81.5 para-educators. I believe we have added two more um, in the last few days. Very excited about that. We have um, 12 speech-language pathologists, 11 school social workers who support special education, eight school psychologists, seven OTs and PTs, two interpreters. So those are the folks that are directly working with students who have disabilities within our district. On top of that, we also have three amazing support staff within the office, behind the scenes, that without them, we could not run the department. So Jackie Clancy, Sue Vanneman, and Meg Pardee um, are all brains behind the scenes, um, and they're amazing. Um, and especially as a new director, it's been just amazing to have um, such wonderful support staff. Um, there's also two special education supervisors, so Lee McFarland and Katie um, LeMay, who also support all of the staff um, on a regular basis. Lee McFarland supporting the secondary buildings, um, as well as, and then Katie supporting elementary as well. So per the Michigan Administrative Rules for Special Education, here are the eligibility categories. Um, so students, when they are found eligible for special education programs and services, must be found eligible under one of these categories. So I won't run through all of them, but you can see they're quite diverse. These are listed in order of where they occur in the MARS rules, so those Michigan Administrative Rules for Special Education. And they are um, quite um, encompassing when you look uh, um, across those. And then we also provide a continuum of supports and programs. So we provide ancillary services. Ancillary services would be speech and language services, occupational therapy, physical therapy, school social work services, for example. We have elementary and secondary resource programming, which um, would include students who require a special education teacher to be a part of their program. Some students require more support than others, so we have a variety of leveled programming within our resource to support a variety of student needs. And then we also have access to center-based programming options within Oakland County. So as a district, we're required to have access or have um, access to a continuum of services. So there are some specialized programming options throughout Oakland County that if um, for some reason one of our school buildings we are un or within district, we are unable to support individual student needs, we may consider um, programming um, outside of Clarkston schools. Um, so there's a variety of those programs throughout the county as well. So we also are aligned with the strategic plan, and I wanted to point out a few um, pieces as I move forward in this presentation. First of all, when we look at our vision and mission, all students are encompassed in both of these, and that includes students with disabilities. And I, you know, when I read this and I became, you know, came on board in Clarkston, and I read that creating a learning environment where students, staff, and family are challenged, healthy, engaged, safe, and supported. It truly does mean all students. Um, and then when I look at the vision and it says, um, students are well prepared for a future that excites them and believe they can achieve their dreams, 
That means all students as well, students with disabilities and their families, as well as students who do not have disabilities. So even when we talk about career readiness and the presentation that was proceeding, those are also supports that will be supporting all students with disabilities as well. So taking a deeper look or, or an overview at the four pillars of the strategic plan, there were some things that kind of stand out to me that I just wanted to bring everyone's attention to. So one, whole person development. And where does the student support services or special education department intersect with this? Um, so individualized education plans or IEPs must consider the whole child. And that is embedded in both our federal and state laws. So committed to a culture of well-being for all. Um, we also have to um, address student-specific needs, and we are always considering as part of the process social-emotional needs, medical needs, academic needs. Um, all of those areas are part of the IEP process, so very much fits in with this pillar. Foundational academic skills, our students have secure foundational and academic skills that connect them with their world. So direct instruction and supporting student growth in the general education curriculum are pieces that the special education department, student services department supports. General education collaboration and professional learning and problem solving together for all students. We're continuing to do this as we enter into kind of next phases of multi-tiered system of supports. Um, again, with that, that next uh, bulleted point, specially designed instruction focused on individual student needs, so making sure that we're meeting students where they're at and supporting the, um, providing them supports, um, and then alignment of the curriculum for students who require alternative essential element standards. So we have some students who, um, because of their disability, are unable to make adequate progress in the common core, typical curriculum that we would have in general education. And so um, the state does have um, an alternative, uh, it's called the essential element standard. So they are connected back with the Common Core, but um, kind of pared down um, for some students. So we're really looking at what are, again, the essential elements required in those. When we start looking at student-focused learning, creating authentic relationships with students, supporting their interests and abilities through personalized experiences, so again, focusing on essential curriculum and individual student needs, connecting and engaging with families in the community. This is something that our department does often and continue to strive to improve with, and individual supports to assist students in how to show what they have learned in multiple <laughs> modalities. So some of our students with disabilities have the understanding of the content, but maybe need to share information a different way. And so again, student-focused learning for those individual student needs is um, very much a part of special education and student support services. And then again, future pathways, the career readiness awareness that we've already talked about, development of community partnerships to support work-based learning opportunities, particularly for our high school students and then our post-secondary students, post-high students. Um, practical assessment exploration system, so you will hear the acronym PAYS Lab, um, which are simulated work environments. We have two of those within the district that is, um, it's pretty amazing, um, and really simulates some work environments and work tasks for students um, with disabilities as they're, um, again, I think it is part of career exploration on a modified um, basis and, and really an amazing system. We've even done some updated training this year as well with the teachers that would typically be using the PACE lab. So excited about that. Transition planning, which this is not just for our post-secondary students. As part of the IEP process, we are required to look at transitions and create transition plans, considering them at age 14 but in place by age 16. And so, again, this is a piece where we're connecting, engaging students in the process, in their IEP process, looking at what they're interested in, looking at where their skill sets are, looking at what can we put in place to support them as they move forward. And then supporting functional life skill development. So um, for all of our students, also supporting, um, you know, for some students, it will be about how can I live as independently as possible um, for some of our students who are more impacted by disabilities. And so supporting functional life skill development is a huge focus of our post-secondary program. So for our students who are 18 to 26, 
um, and um, again, continuing um, support of their academic skills as they relate to functional life skill development as well. So this year, as a new executive director, um, did go ahead and survey parents and staff. Um, and this was to get kind of a temperature check on where things were at, kind of get that understanding. It's gonna take me a while to truly kind of be embedded within the culture, but kind of knowing I needed to gather information to know where, where, where should we even point the compass to, to move forward. Um, this district has had an amazing history of supporting students with disabilities, and so we're gonna continue that. And I've often said that it's, I, I was just handed the baton, so we're gonna keep moving forward um, to improve things. And so this information was very vital to that. And I will continue to use um, surveys moving forward as well. Um, so we had 252 parent um, responses received. <coughs> 8% um, were families of students um, in early childhood, so that would be birth through preschool, elementary, um, K through five, 36%, secondary, 47%, and post high, 9%. And a majority of our students with IEPs or IFSPs are in that elementary to secondary um, realm, so that mm. was anticipated that we would receive that kind of feedback. So I'm gonna quickly go through some of, um, some of the questions that were asked. Um, how many years have you had students with IAPs in Clarkston? Um, clearly a majority of the parents had had students um, with IEPs for at least two years within the district. So far less of um, students that had only been, um, had IEPs for one year um, were part, had responded to the survey. Does the district make a good faith effort in helping their child to achieve um, the objectives in the student's IEP? Um, clearly, very um, overwhelmingly, yes. People um, that responded, families that responded, did say that um, they believe the district is making a good faith effort. This was wonderful to see. Although the colors flip, the um, orange here is, is agree. Um, so I'm considered an equal partner with teachers and other professionals in, de in developing my students' IEP. Um, a vast majority agreed or somewhat agreed with that, which is good because parents are critical parts. They know their child best and need to be not only sitting at the table, but believe that they're an equal partner in developing that plan for their students. So that, this again was um, wonderful to see. Asked a few other questions about engagement and, and how families are feeling about the services so far um, that, that their children have received within Clarkston. Have they been asked about their opinion? About half um, of the student, you know, their opinion about whether or not the services are adequately supporting their child's needs. About half of the families um, said they agreed or somewhat agreed. Some were neutral, and then we definitely had a, a chunk that, that were not necessarily um, feeling that they were asked about that, how things were going. So important information. Written information I received from, from special education staff is written in, in terms that I understand. Again, a majority did believe that that was understandable, um, the content being provided to them. You know, we have a lot of paperwork in special education, and it is not uncommon for IEPs to be at least 10 to 12 pages. Sometimes we will have um, very thorough evaluation reports that may be 30 pages long, depending. Um, and so making sure that information is shared in an understandable way is really important um, so that families um, can be active participants in the process. Staff treat me as a team member. So again, asked in a slightly different way. Um, again, glad to see that a majority of families do feel that they um, are treated as a team member. Um, but again, there is um, a percentage of families that did not necessarily agree with that statement. If I have a question, staff are approachable and responsive. Again, majority agreed or somewhat agreed with that and I believe I'm a partner in the process. Again, very similar. So all of those responses, um, you know, I was really looking at, were our parents part of the process here? And, and, and whatnot. So that's where um, 
these questions came into play. Then when we move forward, I ended up asking, what are some strengths and suggested, suggested areas of improvement for the department moving forward? So here were strengths that parents shared. Our staff are professional and courteous, approachable, wonderful communication, staff is, is an extension of my family. These were quotes from families proactive and positive approaches, collaboration, attentive and accommodating, I feel like my opinion matters, and child's best interest. Those were great, I love that. But it's also very important for us to look at what are suggested areas of improvement moving forward. More consistent parent engagement. These again were quotes from families more peer-to-peer -peer buddies. So that would be peer-to-peer um, -peer support, students with disabilities with students who do not have disabilities or typically developing peers. Challenging my child within realistic goals. More communication with their classroom teacher so skills could be more fluidly used across the day. More information in the community about what is available to support students. Transition support more opportunities for students to stay in their neighborhood school, and more opportunities to interact with neurotypical students and participate in activities. And emphasizing reading and writing. So all of these things, in addition to other comments, as families are listening, um, I did not list every single comment, um, obviously, in this presentation. But all of those pieces are being um, looked at and analyzed kind of into groups. Um, and so we will be using this data as part of kind of our next steps as well. Then we did a staff survey. We roughly have a little bit over 200 staff members within um, the department. And so this was a, a good majority that participated. Paraeducators, school psych, social workers, special ed teachers, OTs, PTs, and speech language pathologists all responded. And we asked questions such as, overall, do you have a clear understanding of the expectations related to your role? And again, a majority did understand, um, you know, felt like they understand the expectations of their role. I would like additional guidance regarding my role and expectations. So I have a pretty good idea of what, I, what I'm supposed to be doing, but I could utilize some additional information. Definitely an area that perked my interest when we saw these results. And then one of my big questions was, select any and all areas for which you need additional training. So in this slide, I kind of I ranked um, you know, by how many responses were received in regards to um, areas of training. Um, you know, we have already moved forward when we think about 21-22. Um, there was, um, we now have a special education teacher, Stephanie Simone, has stepped into a transition coordinator role um, that had not been a full-time role in the past. Um, and so that aligns with um, a lot of parent needs. Um, but transition and some of these other areas, transition wasn't listed as specifically here. However, it is embedded in many of these components. Interesting to me was that parent engagement was the least requested area to receive professional learning. Yet that was one of the highest needs that the parents saw. Mm -hmm. So that will be a component that there was a little bit of a mismatch there. So. Um, you know, what is that all about? We're gonna to continue to explore that. Do we have great relationships with families? I believe absolutely we do. But can we do things even better? Absolutely. And so we need to listen to our families as well as, as our teachers. Um, very interesting as well, um, a couple areas, MTSS, so multi-tiered system of support, um, as well as social emotional supports were very high on the request list for needing more training. We've already started down that process in collaboration with um, Nancy Mahoney and um, the general education staff to do um, combined trainings with our special education staff along with um, the general education staff. So that's a huge piece and component to this. 
Um, and so we'll be continuing to kind of look at these areas and see what groups break down what groups need what, um, but this will help somewhat guide, um, definitely help guide our um, professional learning opportunities moving forward. So when we talk about next steps, there's a few things kind of moving forward from all of this information and all that's already happened in the short period of time this school year. So some of the things that we're gonna be focusing on and have already kind of set the wheels in motion, again, um, expanding transition coordination, leadership, services, and supports. Again, that has already um, moved forward. Very excited about that. Development of systems and guidance to support consistency of services and supports throughout the district. I am very much a systems person. Um, I like things kind of, and, and the larger the system is and the more folks you have, having um, some consistency of practices is important. So we're gonna be looking at those, those pieces. Increasing supports for birth through age three children who are at risk or who have mild developmental delays. Regular collaboration with the Special Education Parent Advisory Committee. We've already met several times, um, and that's, that's been wonderful, um, and have already worked together in identifying um, additional PAC reps from different buildings and, and really increasing the um, family engagement in that way. We're looking at doing some collaborative things, such as kind of a meet and greet via Zoom um, and some additional pre uh, presentations and engagement in that way um, in coordination with PAC. Providing staff with targeted and meaningful professional learning, again, in coordination with general education. Active engagement in general education trainings and collaborative problem solving. Data-driven decision-making. Accessibility of information for families. Um, there, has already been, uh, there have already been quite a few updates to the webpage um, within the district to help families access more information. We're gonna be continuing to expand that as well. And then a focus, as always, as we always should, but continuing to focus on the least restrictive environment for all students. Making sure that students are in their home schools as much as possible, that we are providing students with opportunities in general education as much as possible, and supporting them in the least restrictive way. So I want to th thank you and the community for the continued support of all students. Um, you know, I, this is my 21st year in special education and I've been in Oakland County this entire time and, and, and Clarkston has always been one of the districts that was like the lighthouse for supporting, you know, doing amazing things. And so, you know, I'm thrilled to be um, working alongside this amazing staff and I'm excited about our future and, and next steps and continuing the great work. Thank you so, so thank much. You. I apologize for getting the title wrong. I'm sorry. No, I that's did that. okay. I got the name right. We yeah, did that once you before, did. but you the got title Theophilus wrong. So. Right. That's a hard one. <laughs> any any questions for Mrs. Theophilus? Soft F. I learned that already. I'm looking at Mrs. Catalina. I know this is a particular interest of yours. Yes, it is. I know. Yeah. You know a lot about it. You could I know do that a lot probably. About this, yes. Yeah. <laughs> any questions or comments? Yes. Mrs. McGinnis. Thank go you, ahead. Um, Madam President. A fabulous presentation thank, thank you as a parent who was a had a child who had an IEP um, this in this group of students is near and dear to me um, I want to ask a question about the slide of the question how many years have you had a child with an IEP in Clarkston and I noticed that <clears throat> the majority of uh, responses is in the five years or longer of that group, do you have any idea how many of those students are students that um, are known to not be as successful in making adequate progress? We haven't broken down that information um, per se, um, but I, you know, they are students who, you know are likely students that have more significant needs. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't say they maybe haven't made adequate progress, but they're students who have more significant needs, so they've had IEPs for a long as you, time. As you might have noticed, I was struggling for how to best yes. represent what I was yep. trying to say. Yep. Um, so I, I wonder if w there's a challenge there to recognize within that, I don't know how anonymous your survey responses mm -hmm. were, 
both uh, parent and or staff, but to recognize if there's a trend mm -hmm. within those students as to why they continue to have the need for an IEP. Um, as, and one of the things that I really like about this presentation, I, I really, really respect the fact that you have put yourself out there with this survey. Yeah. Because asking some of these questions are often not easy mm -hmm. um, for the self-reflection of the parent on their own child, mm -hmm. nor the staff who is trying to support the child and bring about that progress for them. So um, that was one of the slides that caught me the most was to wonder how that number broke down into some categories yeah, that it was, we might you know, make some difference. You know, I am the only one that has full access to it, um, and we did not ask names. Um, there are email addresses, um, and there were families that put their names mm -hmm. in comments um, and had, had talked about certain things. Um, one of the trends I did see um, had to do with consistency across, so the longer um, a student had had an IEP, they've come in contact with more individuals, right? More staff, different buildings, most likely. And so kind of that idea of consistency and kind of that consistent practice, I saw many comments in regards to that. So, you know, when I had this team, this is what happened. When I had this team, this is how it went. When I had this team, this is how it went. And so, but always saying that all the staff for the most, you know, had their child's best interest at heart. Mm -hmm. And so, to me, my head goes to kind of systems and consistency and kind of starting to break those pieces down. So we'll, we will continue to explore that. Um, and it is important because, um, you know, over time we want, we want families to continue to feel engaged in the process, feel heard, because again, families know their child best. Um, and so we want families to be partners. So can you speak to the group of students who tend to make up the largest bulk of our special ed, which is the LD student, and what kind of outlook you have for them in order to potentially transition them out of needing an IEP sooner? Mm -hmm. I, I wonder, with the advent of staff becoming trained in Orton-Gillingham, mm -hmm. which I'm very fond of because my child was an LD's child, mm -hmm and it was um, due to being dyslexic. Yeah. Um, so I just wonder if we're gonna um, track or monitor those students who are LD potentially in language due to being dyslexic, and I, and I know the dynamics regarding the coding of that, mm -hmm. um, that we see the progress with it and, and hope that we can move those students out of IEPs and into um, a more general flow with their education. Well, I think, you know, when we when we look at our our move toward a multi-tiered system of support, and we then start looking at um, what they call specially designed instruction, which is mm -hmm. actually the definition, the federal definition of what special education is, we do have some students um, over time that they no longer require specially designed instruction, but they require accommodations, they require supports to be able to level the playing field between them and the other students so that they aren't necessarily requiring that direct instruction, but they've learned, you know, skills, they're accommodating, they have, right, all these other tools at their disposal. And so through utilizing an MTSS process, through having um, more supports for students with and without IEPs, I, I believe that we're gonna see a shift in some of that. Perfect. Um, but, you know, one of the goals this year will be starting to look at those almost 1,200 students and what does it look like? How many students require specially designed instruction versus students who require accommodations? And how can we best support those students? And making sure that students with IEPs truly have disabilities and, not, and aren't just behind or haven't had the same experiences. Um, and, you know, when special education is the only, you know, the only party around, if a student needs help, they need an IEP. Mm -hmm. But with multi-tier systems of support and putting all of these other pieces in place, that may not be the case. And I believe other districts have, have seen that trend change for a variety of students with um, learning difficulties, with social emotional needs, with um, you know, um, att 
retention difficulties, things of that nature. Um, and so we'll be continuing to look at kind of those almost 1,200 students. Not to say they don't require an IEP, because absolutely it's been determined that they, that they need that. But as our system continues to grow and develop in coordination with general education, with teachers, with looking at data, making data-driven decisions, we can start looking at those pieces. Perfect. One final last question, if I may. Remind me, on Professional Development Day, what kind of professional development is done with our special ed staffing versus our general ed staffing? Okay, so I'll speak just to this year because this is the year that I've been here. Um, but just this past Friday, um, we had, we coordinated with um, general education. We attended um, sessions regarding dyslexia with Susan Kacheski from Oakland Schools. So special education teachers um, joined the general education teachers and staff in that process in the morning, which was amazing, mm -hmm. learning together. Um, and then in the afternoon, um, you know, building um, leaders, the principals were sharing information kind of on next steps with the MTSS process within their buildings. And so we had our special education staff participate in that. Um, and so learning together and being able to speak a common language and knowing that all kids are gen ed kids first. We just have some students that need more supports, whether it be through an IEP in special education or through intervention or, or whatnot. And so, Having that shared understanding and shared learning opportunity is really key. Now we do have some some groups that, um, for example, our birth to three, um, you know, uh, folks. We did a separate professional learning piece with them. Our three to five, um, we had the early on director from Oakland Schools led some training with that group, and so we're trying to make sure that we're individualizing as much as possible. But um, my preference will always be to learn alongside general education colleagues, um, it's very powerful when we're, especially as we're kind of delving into this next phase um, of MTSS. Well, thank you for coming to Clarkston. Thank you, I'm, I'm very glad to be here, thank, thank, you. thank you. Trustees, any other questions or comments? All right, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to action items. 6.1 is approval of personnel changes. May I have a motion, please? Move the Board of Education approves personnel changes as listed on the attached sheets. Support. Any questions or comments from the board? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries. Item 6.2 is approval of shared time teacher professional development agreements. May I have a motion, please? I move that the Board of Education approves the agreements for shared time online professional development through Michigan Virtual as presented. Support. Are there any questions or discussion from the board? I think Mrs. Fons provided some additional information from us today, for us today. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries. Uh, item seven is report items. We have our monthly finance report. Mrs. Rogers. Okay. Financial update tonight. We'll be covering the summer months. Um, we do this every year this way. It'll be covering June, July, and August. You were given. Um, all our purchasing and um, all the items that happened during those three months. If you want to go to, let's see, what's the, is it this button? There we go. And so as of the end of August, August 31st, 2021, we are, you know, you, you're not going to see a lot of activity as we just started our new, new fiscal year, July 1st, 2021. But your budget to actuals revenue is around 2%. Um, the majority of that is going to be in local revenue as we do summer tax collection. You're not going to see revenue in the other areas, the state, federal, and interdistrict, because all that funding usually don't start coming in until end of October, November. The state and the federal, their fiscal year is October 1st, where ours starts July 1st. So we do have that lag. 
So the only revenue we really are seeing is local revenue, which is mainly our property tax collection in the summer at this point. Expenditures are at about 5% with instructional, you know, not starting until um, August, end of August. You're not going to see, you're going to see a majority of that expenditures at this point in operations because we started expending operations money July 1st where the instructional piece doesn't start spending until school starts. August 31st, 2021 fund equity, when you look at the three-year fund equity graph, is approximately 12.3 million. And we are expecting our, our fund equity to end at just under 14.5 million as um, we get our audited numbers in over the next few weeks. That's what I'm expecting it to be. Um, so do you have any questions on any of the three months worth of data that was re, um, given to you? Trustees, any questions for Mrs. Rogers? All right, I see none. Thank you very much. Item eight is discussion mm -hmm. items. 8.1 is first reading of bylaws policies. I will turn that over to Mrs. Egan. Thank you, Mrs. Horse. The bylaw committee met September 30th. Uh, we did not meet with the new NEOLA rep yet, so what we did is we picked the two easiest, and they happened to be the top two numerically uh, policies to review. They were bylaw 100 and bylaw 167.3, essentially. The changes are in bylaw 100, the definition of voting. Uh, the current statute allows for remote voting. That was a, uh, um, in response to COVID and that language expires December 31st of this year. So we have a new definition of um, voting. We must be present to vote. Bylaw 167.3, public participation at board meetings um, based on the decision by the U.S. District Court Sixth Circuit. Um, the language has been um, revised a bit. Um, it supports their decision. The, um, there are some deleted options. Uh, some of the language is a little gentler. And um, the options that were picked by the policy committee are consistent with our current practices and um, the policy committee will be meeting this week with the NEOLA rep. So if you have any questions that you would like us to ask on behalf of these two bylaws, we are happy to take that forward. Trustees, what questions or comments do you have for the policy committee regarding these two bylaws that are here for first reading this evening? <clears throat> Mrs. Egan, I wonder if we should check the group affiliation box I think we have it currently in our bylaw, and I didn't really see a reason to take it out. That was my only thought as I went through this. I appreciate you going through the detail. This is when we request um, for speakers who address the board, we request their name and address. And so now adding any group affiliation, if appropriate, before they address the board. It's on page 150. And we can add it. I mean, if that's, mm -hmm. does anyone have any problems with us checking that box? No, I don't have any problem with that. No. That makes sense. Okay. No. We will add that. Yeah. Everyone else okay with that? Keeping that as it is in the cur currently? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Heyer. Right. Any I other? will turn the floor back to you. Madam. All right. Thank you very okay. much. So we'll bring these back uh, next month for approval. Thank you very much. Appreciate your work on policy. Madam President, I, yes, I do have a, a quick question. Oh, sure. Um, I was just trying to find it with this small print here. The comment about somebody else cannot sign somebody else in. Mm -hmm. That's my brief recollection of what, how it's worded. How are we going to enforce that? Let me find it on here. 
individuals may not register others to speak during public participation. So I'm, I'm going to interpret that to mean if John gets there and he knows Sally's coming, but she isn't there yet, and he doesn't see her there, but so he signs her in. Yeah. I don't know how we're going to enforce it. That's true. And I also don't want to be in the business of enforcing it. So if other board members agree with my assumptions there, I'd like to st strike that from the policy because I just don't see how we can enforce it. And the time you go to enforce it, 10 others may have slipped and never been recognized. And I don't want to give the appearance that any one person could feel that they were selected to be noticed if it was perceived to be done under what parameters you're going to recognize that it was done. So I just, I just don't see how we can enforce it, and I just see it being problematic. You, you would agree that we'd want to dissuade that practice? I mean, the, the point is, mm -hmm. I mean, whether it's somebody coming late or somebody even playing a joke on somebody else by putting their name on the list. Do they have to you know, I mean, there's a certain viral signature. videos that have gone around about people who have signed other people up for school board meetings. I mean, that is what we're saying. We don't want that. Now, whether or not we can enforce it is, a, is another story. But I mean, if it's a rule, I think less people will do it. If it's not a rule, I mean, we're saying it's OK. So I, I guess just because we you know, are not fingerprinting people when they sign in doesn't mean we shouldn't say, hey, please just sign yourself in, and please don't sign anybody else in. You know, we want to hear from everybody. They've got to be here to address us. You know, if you're not here, there's plenty of other ways you can call, email, you know, meet if you, if you want to get us information. Well, I would think if somebody signed somebody's name for a person who had no intentions of speaking to the board, the person, when their name was read, could just say, I, no long, I don't need to speak to the board or that is in error and move it on down. Um, I just think that we all at times can get caught in traffic or get caught somewhere where we can't get somewhere on time. And I think it happens where somebody puts somebody's name on it. And I don't want to be, I don't want the board to be in a position where you're going to, the board president is going to make a decision that somebody else wrote, this signature looks the same as this signature and they're two different names. And now you're the one who's going to be telling the second person or maybe the first person or both of them for that matter, because who wrote whose name yeah. that they can't speak. Yeah, I, I really see it as we have a list of 50 people and there's 10 people in the room. And, you know, do, do we really, you know, deal with that at that point? Do we need a mechanism to say, hey, you know, the people that are here that actually want to address the board, we're going to ask you to sign up right now again and we're going to go down that list. I grant that the item is on the agenda. The person can speak at number nine, whether they're late or not. So the person can always speak at number nine. They may not be able to speak at the time a decision is made. And their input and their desire could have been there. Could they email the board beforehand to say, hey, I'm running late? Yeah, maybe they can. I don't see that to be a norm, but I do see a person texting somebody to say, I'm in the parking lot. Where are they at right now? Okay, can, can you put my name down? And I just... If, some, if somebody wants to address the board, I think the intent of the bylaw is that we make every possible opportunity to provide a structure in an orderly way to hear from everybody who wants to address the board. Is, so. is that line on our bylaws currently? Could I just interject a thought here? Um, Mrs. McLean does pick up that sign-in sheet at the very last minute before item three and before item nine. And if, I mean, we, you are absolutely right, Mrs. McGinnis, that, you know, it's not enforceable, but what we could do is have our sign-up sheet where you print your name and then you sign it. And I think that would discourage someone from signing in someone else. I mean, that's an option. I think it's new language, it's Mrs. New McGinnis. Language. So I don't know the intent behind it. Mrs. Horst? Mm-hmm. That is new language, and I'm pretty sure, without 
knowing exactly what Neil intended, is that it's kind of an add-on after the two items that we did not check preceding that. I think the prohibition against having people register to allowing others to register to speak would apply if we require people to sign up the day before or two days before, which is you know, what the court case affirmed that that was allowed, but we're not doing that. So, I mean, I'm ambivalent about whether we keep it or not, but I think that's the purpose for it to begin with. Okay. I have no problem standing with majority, but I do ask that my comment be registered. Yeah. I'm ambivalent about it as well, because I appreciate that we're not going to um, enforce it. And we have a we have a pretty tight procedure in terms of um, of how people sign up and the information that we require of them to sign up. And in, um, so I, I'm perfectly fine having mm -hmm. our committee go back and maybe do some more thinking mm -hmm. about it and trying to digest the intent behind it. But I will say we did talk about it a little bit and we came up with, the, and we were looking through all of the new language and really what we came down to was even if someone is running late for the seven o'clock meeting, item nine usually doesn't occur until eight o'clock, 8.30, 8.45, and that likely wouldn't have been an issue. We did not talk about the enforceability, but I absolutely agree with you that I don't want to ever be policing uh, this type of thing, and I don't see how we could unless someone was taking a license and watching somebody <laughs> sign the paper, which we're not going to do. No. Um, I think we can talk about it again before we put it forward, I think would be the best. and. Okay. We Will you we take, take that, that comment back? Sure. Okay. All right. Thank you for the discussion. Thank you for bringing that up. I think I wouldn't have considered it. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Okay. We have one more discussion item tonight. 8.2 is our master plan facility update. Mr. Goodman, you are up. Good evening. Uh, Dr. Ryan, I'm not sure if you wanted to start anything off with this, uh, but uh, I want to introduce Tom Vandegrein. He's with GMB, and uh, we hired uh, GMB uh, five years ago now, and this is a living, breathing document that uh, we've been working with, and this is a formal update to that document that was created in 2016. We call it a five-year master plan and basically an assessment of all our facilities and sites. And, uh, and then the beginning here tonight, we're gonna talk about capacities um, of, our, of our existing buildings and how our um, um, projections for enrollment uh, affect that and how we're utilizing our uh, existing buildings. So I know a little bit, you have the uh, report in your computers, unfortunately, we're going to kind of do this on this uh, overhead, and we will do our best to uh, uh, keep you to explain because you can't see the projection behind you. Wait, but uh, let me just say to the board, if you're going to start with that, that's at the end of our presentation. Yes. Mm -hmm. so, so trustees, you want to jump ahead to let me find it. I haven't gotten there yet. Wait, oh wait. Building? Building capacities. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's bookmarked. 212. Oh, sorry, I didn't download it. Okay. 212? 210. Mine's on 210. 210. Okay, so page 210 of your packet. And then we'll back up. Mm -hmm. Okay, well. Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Tom, and really the explanation here is just. Uh, Again, he's going to go through quickly. Uh, we'll, sh we'll share one box and then uh, move from the elementaries to the middle school, junior high, and to the high school. Thank you, Tom. All right. <clears throat> so I'll do my best again if you guys follow along. Obviously, you're not seeing what we're looking at here. Um, but, but when we look at the building capacities, what we're looking at is primarily um, the most relevant and objective data is to, to use uh, the Department of Treasury's guidelines. And that's how these numbers are put together. There's all kinds of different um, 
theories as to what a building capacity is from, from different uh, agencies, but this is the most relevant one. It's, it's how the state looks at the, the actual capacity of, uh, of the building. And we went, one, yeah. So the, the first sheet, when you're on that one, if you guys are scrolling down, you know, it has all the elementaries listed there, Andersonville down on through Springfield Plains. And we're going to stop it and look at the bottom of Springfield Plains, and I'll explain that box, and then sort of the summary of all those together. So the box of Springfield Plains, um, if you look at the top there, it talks about teaching stations, and those are as defined by the Department of Treasury, and uh, they have criteria for what is a teaching station and what is not, and those change from grade level to grade level. And so, for example, at Springfield Plains, you're seeing 11 teaching stations from DK to 2, and 11 from 3 to 5 for a total of 22. That gives us the capacity of teaching stations for that building. The next line down, MDT, Michigan Department of Treasury uh, requirement, that's the a number of students they require to be counted for each of those teaching stations. 20 from DK through second grade, 25 for third through fifth grade. Uh, so then the, that, the next numbers down are your capacity as, as Department of Treasury looks at it. So for Springfield Plains, example, 220. Uh, for DK to 2 and 275, sorry, my, my notes are a little small here myself. Um, so the capacity that Department of Treasury sees Springfield Plains is, is 495. Those, uh, we're only going to go through this one box, those are the same kind of logic for all the buildings that you'll see. Um, the next lines below there are for reference only. Be very <laughs> careful for those numbers, with those numbers. Those are numbers that are contractually what you have for a classroom, how many kids can be in a classroom contractually, those are always much, much higher than the actual capacity of a building. Um, but they, they, they answer the question of if someone says, hey, we can get more than 495 kids in Springfield Plains. How can that be? Because you go more than the, the capacity that the Department of Treasury requires us to look at. Um, so use that with a grain of salt. It's really not that relevant. It's the Department of Treasury numbers that are very important. So as you move down to that next, that long bar there, you see all the elementaries listed together there. Uh, the first bar, first vertical column in the Michigan Department of Treasury capacity shows the capacity for each building. Uh, you move yourself across to 2019 enrollment. That's the numbers we used that were the most, uh, the most recent consistent data for enrollment that we could look at for the buildings. And that shows you basically the 3,063 students in your district. And the buildings themselves, uh, that minus 28, that variance says that you have uh, 28 more kids than the Department of Treasury would say is your capacity. So you're basically, if you look at the percentage there of 100.9%, you're right at 100%. You're at a very sweet spot with your elementaries. Um, the Department of Treasury requires an 85% capacity uh, as your low end. The buildings ought to be at 85%. If they're not and they're below that, they start to get nervous. You have too much capacity. Um, and at 85%, they're going to be cautious to let you, uh, why would we need more additional classrooms done on a building like that? So that's a, a, a target that you have to be at. You get past 100, you're at 100 here, which is a perfect sweet spot. You don't have uh, not, not too much room and not, not enough. Um, you get into 110, 115% capacity. That's when schools start, yeah, you start taking over, you know, the Spanish room is no longer going to be that. We need a classroom. So you start taking over and losing programs. You start packing kids in tighter. That's when schools start saying it might be time to add on to buildings. You're nowhere near 115% and you're not near the 85. So just to so understand those numbers, you're really sitting in a very sweet spot with, uh, with your capacities for your elementary schools. Um, the lines right below that, the plant moran, those are your latest um, enrollment projections that you have. There's an A and a B. That's just two different methods they used in their report. They show, we wanted to look at that to see what is the, at least it's short term, it only goes out to 2023, the last report they did. Uh, but any trends they see there that would change what we might be looking at. They basically are saying with the elementaries, um, if anything, it might get a little uh, more capacity, but it's pretty flat. You, you had some loss in enrollment, obviously, <coughs> from the last few years. It's flattening out pretty much everywhere, at, if, per their report, in the 2021 and should stay flat for the most part for all your, uh, all your grades on out, if anything, slowly, slowly increasing. So that report at least tells us there's nothing in that that says uh, we're going to be keep losing kids and so we're going to have a different capacity. You're really where you're at right now in the 2019 is a good number. That's what that really is verifying. Um, I think that's enough for that sheet. Anything you can think of there, Wes, we missed? 
you want to move it up to the middle school and the junior high, whoop, oh, there you go, right there. Okay. <clears throat> so the middle school and the junior high, um, again, the numbers are, you can see the same boxes. You can look at those yourselves. The numbers are a little bit different when you look at uh, the Department of Treasury's requirements. It's 22.5 students um, in a 6-8 capacity, and then it's 21.25 for 9 through 12. And so that's why they're broken apart a little bit how they do the, uh, the calculations. The thing that you'll see there, if you look at the, the enrollment, is that the middle school has capacity. It is definitely your building that has the most capacity. Um, so you look at the variance um, uh, from after the 2019 enrollment column, the variance of 213 students. Um, 2019, you're at 84%. So you're right there at, yeah, you gotta watch that building. That building has got uh, definitely um, capacity in it. Um, it's not at a, uh, a terrible level, but it's, it's certainly nothing we would want to ever add on to in that building. The junior high is setting at 93%. Um, that's a pretty good number. Um, I'd say both of those buildings probably can be, uh, as, as they're looked at, can be also be uh, right-sized in any kind of adjustments that are done to those buildings. The, the Plant Moran stuff, those studies basically show that the junior high for a couple years, I'm sorry, the middle school for a couple years may actually still go down. The number's a little bit and it flattens out. Um, the, the junior high they see slowly rising again, very, very slowly. Basically, you'd call it flat. But that, the middle school is definitely the building that has the most capacity. You go to the high school, you find the numbers there. Um, basically, right at 100% again. The enrollment of 1685 in 2019, that uh, is, is 49 kids more than the capacity, um, which is basically 103%. Again, perfect sweet spot. You're right in the area where, you, where you'd want to be with capacity. Um, Plant Moran, again, they see that building potentially growing a little bit uh, in the next few years with some, um, and, and that's a projection, right? That's their projection of student growth. For the most part, fairly flat. So the last sheet, the last line there, the whole district basically shows you, kind of summarized, your elementaries are very uh, stable at 100%, uh, high school 103 the combined junior high and, and middle school at 88 um, percent, they have some capacity. Most of that's in the middle school. The next sheet talks about square foot per student. And um, so how does that, how does that, how do the buildings sit with square foot per student? And so on the, on the left column is the building square foot, and that's for all the different buildings. You can scroll down through those. The square foot per student, uh, the, th the third column, <clears throat> second column is the Department of Treasury capacity again for each building. The third column is the square foot per student from the design of the, tr the Treasury numbers. So your elementaries are at 149 square foot per student as a whole. That's um, about average, I would say, uh, across the state. Newer elementaries, and we're designing them today's uh, new elementary might design, would be more in the range of 160 to 170 square foot per student. Um, and those numbers do change a lot depending on program, depending on the kind of unique programs you might be putting in and special ed. If you have certain special ed programs, those numbers can go up from that 160 to 170. But your numbers are basically um, very conservative at 150. Um, you're not off the charts with, we have a lot of square foot per student at the elementary level. The middle school and, and junior high, um, 203, 200 uh, square foot per student. Again, those would range from 175 to 250. Those buildings start to have a lot more variation because different kinds of programs, auditoriums, pools, all kinds of things show up. Same thing with the high school. So those numbers can change dramatically depending on what's in a building, what kind of programs are, are offered. But your, your, uh, your 200 square foot is very normal. Um, and the high school at 250, with all the things that are in it, um, in terms of the auditorium and the pool, uh, auxiliary gyms, again, a very normal number. Those high schools will range from 175 to maybe even as high as 300 square foot per student um, in the high 200s. You're sitting in, a, in, in very, uh, very normal square footages. So none of the buildings have excessive square foot per student. The square footage per student is changing over time. The things that affect that 
our um, project-based learning is different than what it was in a lot of the buildings you have designed in the 50s and 60s. Um, it was sit in a chair, listen, look at the chalkboard and take notes. That was a different square foot per student. As we're doing more project-based learning, that takes more square footage per student, so those numbers are going up per, per, per building. More labs, extended learning areas are being provided for kids to break out, have collaboration. Those things are all changing, um, and, and increased special ed programs. Those are all changing. Same number of kids, but the building's bigger. How can that be? In the 50s, we had more kids in here. More programs going on in buildings today, the kind of what's happening. So from the grade configuration, when we studied it and we reviewed it um, with your staff, three takeaways that we got out of it was that um, mathematically, there's no reason um, to change things. Your buildings are well utilized. Uh, they're right at a sweet spot, at, for the most part, 100%. Um, the enrollment projections don't suggest that we're going to have any more loss and, and, and should be stable to where we're headed. The other, other component is that your buildings are very well sized. Um, size of a building affects children in terms of the scale and their comfort level and the, their perceived comfort. And yours are very well sized for learning environments and the comfort for a child. And so there's nothing there that says we ought to resize them for that reason. And then the third one is, is with all the, the, um, the, the research, and not research, but the interviews we did with your staff, for the most part, 100% feel they like the grade configuration we have. There's some tweaks that might, you know, that, that, that might be in, in some instances. But for the most part, the grade configuration is, is liked and think that it is beneficial, sort of sets Clarkson apart to the whole idea of, um, you know, keeping kids younger, longer, and those kind of things came up. And so those three things all kind of come together to say that there's no real reason from a capacity perspective to look at changing any grade configuration or, or anything like that in the master plan. I think that was it there. Anything else you had? <clears throat> no, that covers it very well. Yeah. Any questions that you have to this before we move into the needs the kind of needs list? Questions so far? Just on those buildings. OK. OK, so now following us with your computers, if you go back to that uh, five-year up. update, and um, Amy, if you could pull that up for us. Okay, so again, like uh, I mentioned earlier, this is a living, breathing document. Um, we have <coughs> nearly a million and a half square foot of buildings in the district and over 400 acres that we have uh, things that constantly change and get older and need replacement and, uh, and different things that we, we see in trends that are out there. So um, the, the list is uh, it's not new. It's kind of um, our evaluation over the last year with all of our directors and principals and administrators has been to uh, verify what was on the list. Are they still necessary? As well as what would be new. And um, I'm going to have Tom again kind of go through this, but we've got it in categories of uh, the categories you see there, and then uh, we drill it down through this report. We're not going to go through every page of the report, but um, you can get the information <laughs> on how we drill it down, how it impacts each building. And then uh, really we're going to give you a little overhead of the themes that we found um, while doing the report. And um, again, kind of going back to why we started with the building utilization to see how that would impact how we go through uh, the needs on this list. All right, <clears throat> yeah, so if you recall, and in 2016, we completed the master plan, which this is what we handed out. Um, this was all the information. Some of you are new, I know, from, from when we had done this. But this was an intensive study at the first time. We went through a lot of building walkthroughs, had engineers and architects looking the buildings over, assessing the, the, the district, as well as all the community surveys and staff surveys and then your staff interviews and created this. We are continuing on that process. We're not creating a new process. We just went and validated this and updated it. So that's what you're seeing here is an update. So the format is the exact same. We intentionally wanted this to be the exact same format, but updated. Um, then I'll explain kind of how that, how that document looks to you. So <clears throat> it is a living document. I want to be very, very um, upfront that the dollars are the most fluid thing right now. The scope that's in here, we have quite well defined. There's probably a few things that seems to creep up every day, a few more items that want to be included. 
but the dollars are the thing that we're working on the most right now in terms of a, of, of a rough draft that we're in. I just want you to be aware of that. Um, so <clears throat> I'll go to that first sheet, um, which is the category summary. And what we had is when we did this um, initial master plan, we divided all the needs into different kinds of categories. And they're the categories listed there. First was safety and security, items that improve safety and security for the district, operational efficiency issues, community pride, uh, extending useful life. That's the biggest category typically in anything because it has to do with things that are just wearing out, if I could put it that way. And then 21st century learning environments, what are some new things we really want to try to put into the spaces? Improve learning opportunities, creating uh, improving spaces acoustically, potentially, et cetera, that make the learning space a better space. And then enrollment growth. And then the last, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the last category being technology. So you can see here that that second column to the right there is the uh, 2021 needs list. That's all the items that are left on the master plan today after we took out all the things we've done in the 2016 um, efforts that were done by the district. So that, that needs list comes down there and you can see the numbers, um, 321 million, that's the entire needs list for the district. The next column is the high priority list that as an administration we said we think these are the things that are um, prioritized right now that should be evaluated that, that have a, should be done sooner than later kind of a thing. Um, the yeah, they should be con for consideration soon. Now, certainly that's something we're working on, but that, that's what this, this uh, second column is. The next sheet is the same, you'll find the total is the same at the bottom, but it's organized by building. So you have this, the needs now organized, uh, all the needs, so Andersonville <coughs> would have all those safety and security, community pride, extend use of life, those are all under uh, Andersonville's sheet, if you look at that in the back of the, of the document. Same thing, the wish list to the left, that needs list, and then the, the proposed uh, needs to the right. The next sheet is um, technology. And uh, again, it's the same kind of thing. Left, left side is what was in the master plan left. You can see that's totaling 30 million. And then right now, proposing 17 million in, in, in current needs uh, in terms of a high priority. The next sheet talks about when you get into the details for each building, and that's going to be the last one we look at, is each building has a set, of sh a set of sheets that describe all the needs. This is the key that helps you understand what some of those things mean. Um, I did add this, if you went back to the 2016 report, I did not have this information in there. But when we reviewed these items with these different uh, principals and, and, and directors, et cetera, I noted those items from those people. So when you go to that sheet, you'll see, for example, the facilities, there's a Y, a green Y that shows up. That's where that item originated from or was supported by that person. The next um, column to the right of that is either shaded a little light blue box next to it, and that key will show you that. Either that, go up, just go up to the key one more time, right there, yeah. That light blue box um, next to the item indicates that it was in the 2016 master plan, and it was an item that is done by the district um, in the, in, throughout the, uh, the 2016 bond took care of that item, so it's, it's completed. If it has that dark blue box next to it, that was an item that was requested in the 2016 master plan, so we knew that it had some history, but it got deferred and did not make um, the wish list and get taken care of. And then as we went through the, the review with your staff, et cetera, new items came up. Obviously in five years, different things uh, came up, different items. So those items that are on that list that have a, a, a white box, that don't have a color next to them, those are the 2021 master plan updates that are new items. That's the key that'll help you as you look at each uh, building. So I think you can go to the first one, which is just the Early Childhood Center, and I'll just give you a simple uh, explanation of that. Basically, every again, as I said, every building has two or three sheets that list all of their, their requests. They're organized again, as you can see. In this one, you see the safety and security, and then operational efficiency, and on down the line. That categorizes uh, the wish list together. The first column, again, to the left is who, who the prioritization of where it came from, who asked for that item, or who supported that item. 
And then that, again, that next blue or light blue or white box tells you, uh, was it in the master plan before or is it a new item? Then it's the list of the items and then some, some spreadsheet there that, is, uh, that we use to start creating some costs for those items. That estimate value is basically all of the 2021 needs. And then the next column over is just tracking those ones that were done in 2016. And those are all critical needs that were taken care of. The district has completed those. And then the last column to the right, when those are a dark dollar value, those are the ones that add up to that, that suggested value we had in the front sheet um, of what, what right now we're proposing should be looked at uh, sooner than later. That totals up that 181 million or whatever on the front sheet. <clears throat> so um, I think the, the themes that we found going through it, uh, if you go through all the documents of all the different buildings, are air conditioning became an important one, that we look at air conditioning, and that's, these are things, when I say they're themes we found, they're the things that are pulled forward in that recommended uh, list to, to work on uh, sooner than later. Air conditioning and air quality for the buildings is one of the things that we, we found as a theme that we've pulled forward. The other one is a very important one um, and, and was, was identified back in 2016 was the junior high that um, the junior high is uh, a building that needs update replacement soon. And that was identified in 2016. We had to hold off because of the amount of expense that was requir required by that. Um, but that is something that still is, is, is coming forward as we really need to look at replacement of the junior high. The third thing that came out was some building equity things. Certain buildings had certain things who need some equity issues between, uh, between some of the buildings, especially the elementaries because they're, they're all uh, neck and neck together. The last one, or the fourth one, is useful life. Again, the things that are just wearing out, cons uh, coming back to that next priority of the things we did um, in 2016. There's now the next next priority of things that need to be replaced. The last one um, is some technology upgrades. Those are the, I'd say, the five themes that we've found that are, are what, if you look at that 181 million that are in that that dollar value. I think that's. A whirlwind, but um, <laughs> don't know how much detail to get into either. It's it's overwhelming with all the all the data, obviously, in there. Yes, I think in a word, yes, it is overwhelming. It's it's quite a list, and it's it's quite a lot of detail. And so um, I don't know, Mr. Goodman. I, I would say maybe if you could just give us a sense of how at this point can we be helpful, right? I mean, I know. Um, you know, we've had a couple of trustees um, follow very closely with you uh, throughout the bond and, and, you know, serve as a liaisons. And so I know they're um, very well versed probably in what is on this list still and, and, you know, have some thoughts about, you know, kind of what maybe still, you know, going forward, I think probably what needs to happen. And so what is it you would like maybe from us at this point? Yes. Um, I know Mr. Heyer and Mrs. Egan have served in those roles. And so... How can we be helpful at this stage as you continue to refine this plan? Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. That, uh, a big piece of that theme goes back to the junior high. And as we updated this plan and we look at uh, what it would take to renovate that building to, be, um, to bring it up to the standard we expect um, and, and what our staff and students and community would expect, um, it's, it's approaching the cost of replacement. And um, to really give good estimates to the cost to replace that building, um, we need to do more programming, dive into what is a uh, junior high in 2021 look versus that building that was built in 1959 and is now over 60 years old. And uh, so really that's one that we would like, and I'll get time to kind of tell you what programming means. But that, that's a big one that takes some time to uh, dive into that a little more. And um, yeah, let me bring Tom up to explain programming. Sure, what, what we need um, is an architectural program. And so it's a little bit different than maybe some of the educational programming language, but uh, it basically exists, uh, consists of, of all the spaces that we think are, what do we need in this building? Let's say we're gonna do a new building. How many spaces do we need? How many science rooms? How many of this? How many of that? So it's a quantity, listing of all the spaces that are needed. Then it's looking at the, the quality of them. What kind of things are happening in these buildings? What kind of things wanna happen in these spaces? Um, because it's different, the way we're educating. This whole project-based learning thing is different than in 1959, when you just sat in your chair and took some notes. 
And so it's those discussions which need to be uh, some workshops with your staff to talk about what would that look like if we replace this building. Because right now I just have in there one for one replacement. That, that would be sort of a mistake. Just, just get a new building with new paint, but it's the same layout as we had before in terms of, 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 a, of a program. And then the last thing is relationships in, in the building. So these spaces have a good relationship together. Some of these collaborative spaces and how they might support extended learning to a classroom. Um, so it's a lot of educational discussion, educational theory about how you want to teach in that space. Um, that develops a program which ultimately ends up with a square footage for me that and then I can move easily into that would cost X. We, we don't have that yet. We've done, I've done what I think is a very <coughs> safe <laughs> look at it, but it's more of a one-for-one -one replacement. That, that programming is very important to understand. If we're really going to do a new, new junior high, um, uh, let's, let's make sure it's something you're proud of. You know, that's a 2021 building, not something from, from the 59. So that's the piece we need to get going on to yeah. better understand that. And what I'm hearing is that, I mean, your recommendation, having looked at this, is that you think um, the replacement is better than the renovation. I mean, and the cost as you're approaching it is, it, it's just, it's, it's not going to be worth it to just renovate it and then having to keep yeah. renovating it when we yeah. can create something that's going to last another 50, 60, 70 <laughs> years and service educationally much better for the kind of yeah. program that we offer. Can, can yeah, I get an understanding on that point? I think, you know, just to recap make sure I, I, I've got and maybe we've got what we're doing here is we went through a very exhaustive exercise in 2016 talking to all of our staff, all of our teachers, parents, the community. We got a lot of input and a lot of feedback and we came up with a list that no shocker was way bigger than we could possibly tackle at that point. We, we tackled what we could get done. We're on the tail end of that with just a tiny bit of few projects left that, that still need to be done. We did everything we wanted to do on that list and then even a little more we were able to do because you know we just we got some economies of scale and we saved on some things. Um, and, and so that's that's complete. That was the 2016 version. And so five years later, based on our direction as a board, we've said, all right, it's time to update this. Um, you know, master plan as we call it. It's time to update the list. There are things on the list that were, st were there in 2016 that we didn't do, and those get rolled forward. And then since then, you've talked to almost all of our staff and, and gone through the process of s looking at, all right, what is, you know, no longer viable. I mean, we're constantly auditing our roofs and parking lots and mm -hmm. things like that, looking at, you know, obviously we can't do all of them all, all at once. So, you know, what are the most critical high needs areas? What needs to be addressed? And so now we've got a, a new list that is really what what really can't probably wait too much longer, I think is how you put it. And and so you're, you're bringing us kind of that high priority version. So we have a, you know, everything on the 2021 list and then now a 2021 high priority. Is that accurate so far? Yeah. Okay. And so, so as a board, we really need to weigh in on that, and it's our job as a board to represent our community and say, all right, is, there, is everything on this list community appropriate? Is this, is this what, what we want for our district and what we want for the direction that we're going to go in? Um, really long term, you know, the, the things that we're doing here, some of them, you know, might be things like furniture that have a shorter life. Some of them might be things like a building that could last, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60 years or more. Um, so we want to make sure we're, we're doing things the right way. When it comes to the, the junior high, last time around, we, we purposefully did not invest mm -hmm. in <clears throat> mechanical systems, in infrastructure kinds of things. We, we really, if it was my recollection, and, and confirm it if I'm remembering right, because five years is a long time, we, we really spent as little as we possibly could to get by at that point. Is that is that we, Absolutely. We, I mean, remember we had some meetings where we actually, even in the design phase, said, I think we can pull some things out because it's this building needs a lot of work in the future at the junior high. Mm -hmm. The thing that we spent all the money on, if you look at there's a dollar value, we spent some money on it, was the furniture right. because we said that will at least give those kids in that building a, a very different experience educationally in the rooms they have for now. And that furniture can be moved to anything we do in the future, which is updated or new. And so we didn't feel we would lose anything with the furniture. And that's really the only money we spent. And, and, and so it, it, in terms of the building at this point, I, I think we're, we're based on conversations that we've had. And I'm certainly not a construction expert, but uh, Mr. Goodman you know, teaches me at least something new every time he gets up and gives me an update on terminology or you know something going on. I think when we talk about heating systems and air conditioning and we talk about 
you know, a lot of the climate control components, you know, things like windows and, and efficiency components, their insulation, you know, some of the structural integrity of what we have going on in that building, you know, what we would have to do to modify it to really suit our needs. As you add up the cost of all those kinds of things to bring that building really up to the standards that we've established in the rest of our buildings when it comes to roofs and parking lots and safety and, and learning spaces and, and all those kind of components, that, that's where you're saying if you make a list of all those things, and I think we have that list, um, you know, that starts to get into the cost you know, very, very closely to what if we took at least a component of that building and said, all right, if we had a new academic wing and, and we started from scratch, you know, what, 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 what would that cost? And, and in that case, that maybe newer building would be way more efficient to operate than even retrofitting our current building and overall save money yeah. in the long run. Is that kind of an accurate portrayal? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, very much. Because okay. we have, at the junior high, we are, we are um, approaching, we're over half value of that building with renovations that would have to be done. You have a lot of failing infrastructure, stuff under the ground. If you walk that building, you can see the floors where pipe is problems below the ground. Um, and we're approaching three quarters value of that building in the numbers that we've been looking at. That's far beyond what we'd recommend that you put money into it. Because remember, this building is 60 years old. If we put money into it to say, let's make this a nice building like the rest of your district, um, you're gonna have to live with that building another 30, 40 years. And so do you really want to be looking at something 90 to 100 years old um, that has a lot of things that are in here and I can't get fixed, like very small classrooms? That is not the model that's good for learning right now is a very small classroom. That in here and I can't change um, without blowing the thing totally up. So it, it, I would kind of equate that to there's a point where it doesn't make sense to repair the car anymore. You get a new one. Yeah. Is that that's kind of yeah. kind of where we're at with this. And so so I think. I mean, as a board, I think we, we need to look at this list, and I know I've gone through it pretty exhaustively and, and uh, when Mrs. Egan and Mrs. Horst and I looked at this um, to, to just take a, a first glance at it as it was coming to the board. You know, it's, it's, I think our chance as a board tonight, right here, probably the next time we're gonna look at it, because I think there's gonna be several versions and drafts of this as we kind of tighten it up, so to speak, and we're gonna have different inputs for you. Um, it's our chance to say, you know, no, nope, I don't think we want to go in this direction or, you know, maybe head a little bit more in this direction. Um, but this is kind of our chance to have some input on this, I think, is, is where we are here. And um, I would say that the first thing that, that <coughs> I had on my list that I, we kept it so that everybody could see it um, here tonight. But, you know, we've already gone through, this will be the second round of our master plan. It, it, there's still an ice rink and a... Um, a new pool in here that like I don't think we have any intention of really doing in our probably lifetimes um, here based on the program and the direction that we're in I would I would suggest just eliminating that it says not in master plan right next to it um, but I I would suggest to my colleagues that that's not something we want to carry forward that was some input we got from our community uh, five or six years ago and, and we put it on the list because everything got on the list and then we prioritized what we want to do but I would say that would be a great place to start um, so that nobody gets any misconceptions about what we're intending to do. Um, I certainly do not want to build another pool. I don't think we as a board want to go in that direction. I don't think we have um, a program to utilize an ice rink. Although Mrs. Egan did have the idea that maybe we could freeze the current pool and <laughs> dual purpose, but that's not practical. So I, I would say that that's certainly one that, that um, you know, a couple things that we could tweak and change. And then just, just to be clear on the document, if, if there's a number in the far right column, you know, that, that's, those are the items, because there's a lot of items on this list. This yes. is a lot of pages. And I think that the, the items that have a bold number in that far right column are really the ones that are, are, that are really truly on the list. So there's a lot of things in here that aren't. And I will say as I went through this, it was very obvious that we were trying to have parity. Mm -hmm. in, in terms of what we were doing and, and not that every building needs to be exactly the same or every building has exactly the same needs um, but certainly from a mechanical standpoint from a maintenance standpoint there are certain consistencies of things um, you know like generators or keys or um, you know some of the HVAC components that you mentioned you know we, we do want to be consistent with those things and, and I appreciated that effort what other comments trustees I know it was a lot of information to digest, but what other, what things jumped out at you? Mrs. Horst? Yes, ma'am. 
Um, I think um, most of us have been through the, the junior high um, and when the new furniture arrived, we did all of our building tours and you could see while well, the new furniture was very nice, it was packed in very tightly in some of these classrooms, which I think um, further is, is a further display of how tiny those classrooms are and how the teachers really probably couldn't utilize the new furniture to the full capacity that we had intended. It's just, um, it's, it, just it just doesn't fit for, the, for our class sizes. So um, the other thing too is looking at that classroom area. I don't know what year that um, area was kind of added on. Wasn't that like there were some additions or some renovations back there? I don't know how old that is, but um, yeah, I know air conditioning, um, well, it doesn't exist, but I mean, even heating and cooling, I've been in some of those classrooms where you get a warm sunny day and some, like the science rooms are just incredibly oppressive. Um, so, I mean, there is a lot of work in what I would call just that classroom area, that kind of big square. And the other thing that sticks out in my mind is um, accessibility. You know, we have all these different kind of layers and we've kind of retrofitted ramps to make it easy for anyone with any kind of physical disability to maneuver through that part of the building, but it just does seem um, physically not as functional as we want it to be. And I think we saw that when we toured it. At, you know, I don't know, was that 218, 2018? Yes. And I guess I, I didn't make the point that, you know, there are maybe some components of that space that we could keep you know that are newer and so I think you know that's something that you're looking into as well like certainly with you know in building something in 2003 um, it's certainly not at the end of its life at this point and we would certainly maintain you know for instance the performing arts center right. or something like that right. where there might be other areas that are 50 or 60 years old that you know are well beyond their useful life so it, it's not necessarily an all or nothing right. um, proposition but I, I believe you're still working on really coming up with a good recommendation on what, what, could, what could stay, what should stay, and, yeah. and what needs to be um, gone. And, and I think um, the, the site poses some challenges in that how do, you have, how do you have kids in a building that you're working on as well? Um, and, and that's something that we'll have to consider as, as we go forward, what options we have um, there. That's certainly a consideration. Mrs. McGinnis. Madam President, um, I just wanted to bring up this district has embarked on a very arduous plan since the early 1990s of our school buildings. In particular, I was the co-chairperson of the first successful bond campaign in this district in 25 years, which built Springfield Plains Elementary. At that time, Dr. Roberts brought forth a short, an immediate, a short and a long term plan to bring about changes to our buildings that was direly needed. We didn't have cafeterias for our students to eat in. They were eating in the gymnasium. We were trying to decide whether our kids could have, could eat or they could do gym class. Um, a lot of the buildings needed dire renovation. Technology was just coming into the education field at that time. And we didn't have the general fund being the lowest funded school district category in the state to provide these services to our students at the time. I'm really proud of the work that we've done in this community, building Springfield Plains Elementary, Independence Elementary, putting uh, cafeterias on all our elementary buildings, updating our current buildings, and most certainly keeping our children younger longer with the way we've designed and utilized our buildings for our students' educational purposes. This conversation about whatever we're gonna do with the old Clarkson High School, the now Clarkson Junior High, is not a new conversation. And I, I really wanna make sure that our community knows that this is a conversation that this board, several of us who have been around for quite, quite many years, have been having uh, for a long time. And we've been limping along, 
doing what we can to keep that building at par for our students, the small classrooms is just unbelievable. You're like in a cookie jar. It's so small in there. Um, the, you spoke about the pipes in the floor, cement floors, that is just something that just can't be repaired. So I'm sure we have leakage underneath everything, um, damaging the foundation of our buildings. Um, so this conversation is not an easy conversation because that building, not unlike the building across the street, um, is something that's a landmark to our community. Um, but it's something that has to be done for our students' education. And um, it's, it's gonna be a hard task because we're gonna have to keep students in the building or some parts of the building while we're demolishing other parts of the building should our community agree with us and allow us to go forward on this. Um, but please know this is not a conversation that just happened today. This is a conversation that's been happening since the early 1990s and we have done the best we can at keeping that building in the best condition it can be in for our students' education. Um, I look forward to having deeper conversations about this because um, they're necessary, they're gonna be difficult, and the price tag is not gonna be cheap. The other thing is, is that we have done an excellent job as stewards of our community's money. Every time we have asked for our community to stand behind what this board has asked for, we have repaid it earlier than we said we would be able to. We have been diligent in getting our bonds refunded to us and saving this district millions, probably over 10 million in the finance charges that we have had to pay for the borrowing of this money from the state so, and or those who fund the bonds. Um, so this is an arduous task. I welcome our community to be part of this conversation because this is your building too. This is not just this board's building or this administration's building, but this is the building that we educate our students in in this community. And I think it's time that we start having deeper conversations about how we're gonna go about this and what it's gonna cost us. Thank you. Thank like you. like to add on. Dr. Um, Ryan. Thank you, and just perspective building. You know, like any homeowner would have to do at intervals and like any institutional management that's out there in any industry, it's our jobs to make sure that intervals that we review, we look at the overall physical plan. As Mr. Goodman said, we have upwards of a million and a half square footage within Clarkson schools. And it's important that we, from time to time, update master plan, that we look at things that near end of life, that we discuss them openly, and that we provide our Board of Education and our community with an accurate and a broad assessment of what the physical state of the district is. You know, I know it's, it's quick to start to get into other side or other or dreaming type conversations, but really the intent of the administration this evening was really to bring it to the attention of our board and community some of the bigger, bigger needs list items that came out of it, some of the trends that we saw, and just to get your support to kind of continue to evaluate and build uh, a greater understanding of where the end's in. And, uh, I, I'm excited to hear, you know, when we, we bring out, you know, certain elements that immediately as I'm listening across the board, you know, talking about building a new building or you know something like that you know really at this point we're looking at just that notion of getting a better understanding of what our assets are and we we can't not pay attention to it you really need to bring it to the forefront and to get conversations going both with the board uh, with our bigger community and get feedback our community we need to be a partner hand in hand moving forward as we get more information and uh, it would be my intent as your superintendent and with my team here over the next several board meetings to continue to update that. And where it goes will be dictated by, you know, input we get from our community, discussion from our Board of Education and our staff and, and, and thoughtful planning as we move forward. I think it's our duty always to keep this on the forefront and make sure that everybody has the information is well informed, has understanding, and it's not one of those situations where we get five years past and, well, why didn't we talk about that? You know, where did it go? Now the, the roofs are all leaking, part of the building's falling down, or. In the case of junior high, there's a fault going through the middle of it, actually separating part of the building. You know, where are these, where is this information and what do we do about it? We never want to be in a state where we incur costs to our community because lack of care, lack of investment, lack of stewardship uh, over time. So they, again, it would be our intent. Again, I appreciate the conversation. That was great tonight. Uh, but we wanted just to just have your support to continue to evaluate, to dig deeper. As Mr. Heyer said, you know, I don't think anybody with straight face would say we intend to build an ice rink. But when you listen to your community and people provide ideas, you make sure we capture it. And as you heard from Mr. Goodman, you know, 
a lot of ideas don't make it past just that generation. We just don't want to make it that we don't listen it to, to individuals out there as we start to refine you know, a, a needs list. And then you kind of go through the steps to say, you know, what is actually critical? And then way down the road, you know, what do we do about it? And if nothing is an, a an option or, you know, 101 different directions that we could take it in uh, in a very open, direct way with our community and with board. So I appreciate your attention, your presentation tonight. And just in terms of process, Dr. Ryan, I think, you know, to, to tag on to what you said, we, we as a board have asked you to update the master plan and you and Mr. Goodman and our team, um, you know, has, has undertaken that. And, and our process now is really to understand what's everything on this list. You know, we're, we're certainly not um, seven experts from the community in, in mechanical systems and construction. And so I, I assume people have some some questions on things on the list, now is a great time, whether it's tonight or between now and the next meeting or at the next meeting, um, to, to pull all those questions together. And ultimately, you and your team are gonna refine you know, what's on the list, having those conversations with the things that we mentioned. At that point, once you deliver to us a master plan that ultimately we'll probably approve, um, to say this is our current master plan, and it's gonna continue to evolve at that point, but we, we get to approve it. It's our job as a board being in charge of the infrastructure and facilities to then decide, are there things on this list that we want to tackle? When are we going to tackle them and how might we pay for it? You know, and th that's really a, a, a secondary kind of piece. I and mean, we have not directed you um, to, to put the cart before the horse, so mm -hmm. to speak. I mean, at this point, it's really an understanding to make sure we as a board, if we're going to approve a list, you know, again, like we did five years ago, like we did before that, um, you know that that we understand everything's on it and and you know as we have our our critical needs we we as a board it's our job to make sure those are critical needs for our community and our, and our district and and that's a very deliberate process that we're going through and i appreciate it we've got great really solid folks um in in all areas of our district but this is one where you know we've relied on on uh, having a great team and and successfully executing our our projects in the past and and you know, there's certainly a high level of trust within that team, and we appreciate the information that we get, and, and you know, having straightforward answers, and you know, learning about things that we might not be so um, up to speed on as as uh, um, you know our team is. So I, I think it is that collaborative process, um, but it is definitely I think for the next I don't know Mrs. Horse controls the calendar here for, for the next um, at least probably two or three months I would say we're going to continue to refine to try to get to a point where we feel as a board comfortable saying, yep, this is our list. And, and then we'll decide you know, where we go from there. Well, and I think for tonight, it became obvious um, after having the first discussion, it became obvious that the list couldn't go any farther until we had this sort of big pivotal discussion about the junior high, that you need some direction from the board in terms of how do you continue to study this? I mean, there's a big number on there, but there's a big question too, in terms of, you've said what you need. I mean, you need us to tell you, can you continue to investigate it? Are we comfortable um, having you continue to move forward with the idea that replacement is on the table? And so I'd say I'd put that, I'd put that to everybody. I mean, can we come to consensus? Is everyone comfortable that GMB and Mr. Goodman can, can do the investigation that they need to do in terms of fine tuning that as a piece of, of the master plan, the facilities master plan? Absolutely. I think we need to look at all options at this point, and they'll, they'll give us the best advice they can. I have great confidence in them, but I do think that we need to look at everything at this point. Okay. Just a quick comment. I mean, when we were in our committee meeting on the master plan um, a couple weeks ago, you know, we kind of threw out ideas, and we looked at even Sashabaugh Middle School, and when we look at that building capacity, which is... 242, almost 243 square feet per pupil versus the junior high is 215. But we did just talk about, you know, we have an old part of Sashabal Middle and we have a new part of Sashabal Middle. And how do we, you know, certainly the older the building, the more cost there is to um, not just maintaining it, but operating it. Um, certainly from like an HVAC consideration. And so some of the things that I think we should be looking at is that building, what's the square footage, if we can break it out by sixth versus seventh grade, because I think this is consolidated on this chart. Am I, is, that a, is that a correct assumption? They're put together. Yeah, sixth they're put together. together. Yeah. And then um, 
you know, we talked about too how centrally located um, the junior high is. Like Sashaba Middle School is almost the furthest point an uh, Anderson Elementary family would have to go to. Like the, it's like the direct opposite side of Clarkston, where this long rectangular kind of geographic community. And so some of the things that I think we should consider or you should consider um, is, is there a way to, you know, I don't know, like do you have two, two different wings perhaps to the junior high where one is middle, one is junior high, and we can keep our grade configuration. I mean, if, you know, and I don't know, but, um, you know, we have transportation issues too this year, so I don't know if it makes sense to consolidate the campus for secondary so that it's more central for all our families, but it's just something to think about. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate that, Mrs. Egan, the, the comments. I think it's our really duty as a board to, to direct the administration. I mean, I think, I think, you know, we do want to explore a new building. I mean, I certainly would not be in favor of, of pouring money into a building that, that is not going to have you know, a, a longer life to it. I mean, why, why would we invest in something that we know isn't going to last the length of time it should? I mean, that, 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 that's not financially responsible. Um, having said that, if we're going to make a big investment like that, I think, you know, we, we, we as a board should ask, you know, are there other great configurations? Are there other configurations that, that might make sense? You know, ultimately, we could, we could decide, no, we want to stick with the current grade configuration. Um, but we haven't always had this great configuration. You know, we haven't always done things the way we do right now. And while it's all familiar um, and it's working, uh, that doesn't mean that we should stick with it just because we've had it. And, and while it might be a, a looking at options and saying, mm, I don't think we want to do any of those. I, I think we, we certainly owe it to our community to say, what if? Um, and, and I don't know that we need an exhaustive plan of what that is, but we have all the capacity numbers and you could move things around it see what makes sense and address potentially some transportation issues. But as we go through the next few iterations of this, I'd certainly like to look at, are there other options, you know, that, that we should at least talk about, you know, if not consider. Let me just go through everybody. Mrs. Catalina, are you comfortable pursuing the idea of new building? Okay. Mrs. Green? Yes. All right. Mrs. McGinnis, I feel like I got your input on that. Yes. Okay. So I think you have the go ahead to um, do the research you need to do in terms of programming. And, and we'll just, I would ask trustees maybe to just do a, you know, a deep, deep dive into this list. And you know, knowing, now that you understand the document a little bit better, look on that right side that um, GMB and our facilities folks have identified from the internal perspective only uh, in terms of critical needs and maybe start to take a look at that. And then you can see then what else is still on the list that was brought forward from 2016 that may have been added as well. And as Mr. Heyer suggested, I mean, he's already identified some things that, you know, he would, he would uh, jettison. jettison 86, whatever the, the term is, um, you know, and so if there's anything like that, maybe start to compile a list and I'll check in with you maybe mid month and see how we want to continue. But I think you're right. I think this probably becomes a monthly conversation for the next couple of months anyways, as we continue to to have these conversations and then I would assume as we continue to refine it, then going out to our community and starting to have those conversations with them is part of this process as well. Okay. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. All right. R really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Do we need three minutes while I, board's okay, plow ahead? I'm just checking. Okay. All right, well, I'm happy plowing ahead. I'm just looking at everybody else. Okay, we'll move on to item nine, citizen comments. Mrs. McLean is going to collect the sheets. Citizens are welcome to address the board on any topic at this point in the agenda. Hopefully, if you wish to address the board, you have signed in. And I had a handful who had signed in early. Uh, I just wanna check with Mr. Whittington. Is he still in the audience? Sir, you did not complete the record as I needed you to. Did you still wish to address the board? Okay, if I could get you to please come finish this.
Okay, so we'll wait for Mrs. McLean to get back with, um, with the sheets, but I'll go ahead and give you a heads up. Our first couple of speakers, if you want to find the microphone closest to you, but we're not going to start just yet. Uh-oh. Are we getting some technical <laughs> things ready there, Mrs. Seaman? Okay. First up will be Morgan Saradsky. I'm going to try my best with names, and then we'll have Samantha Brandon. If you want to make your way to the microphone that's closest to you, but give me just a few minutes, okay? I got to wait for my other sheets to get back. And just as a reminder, when you step up to the microphone, if you'll please give me your name and address, and I guess group affiliation, if any, and uh, you'll have two minutes. Challenging me with your handwriting tonight. Okay, and please remember uh, that this is one-way communication. We are so happy to hear from all of our um, community members tonight, but the board does not respond to um, questions or comments from our audience. Okay, Morgan. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Morgan Saratsky. My address is 6227 Parkridge Court. I am a senior at Clarkston High School, and I am representing the CHS Gay Straight Alliance. Good evening. My name is Morgan Stratsky. I'm a senior at Clarkston High School, and I use they, he, she pronouns. I am bisexual and gender fluid, and I'm speaking on behalf of the CHS Gay Straight Alliance, asking that discussions about LGBTQ plus people are included in our sex education curriculum. In recent years, we have made great strides toward creating safe environments for queer students, but there is still a lot of room to grow. According to a national survey done by the Trevor Project, 75% of queer youth reported that they had experienced being discriminated against based on their sexuality or gender identity at least once in their life. And over 50% reported that this discrimination occurred in the past year. Discrimination towards queer youth often comes in the form of bullying from peers at school, which in turn makes queer youth students feel unsafe in school environments and hinders our learning experience. Additionally, being queer is often treated as a taboo topic, and most parents do not teach their children about queer relationships. It is also not talked about in the classroom, which leaves many queer students feeling frustrated, confused, or ashamed. The internet ends up being our main source of information on queer sexual relationships, but it is not always the best source. Websites have outdated, inaccurate, information or our unrealistic portrayals of queer relationships. It took me years to fully understand and embrace my sexuality and gender identity. Having these discussions in school would have allowed me to accept myself without the years of confusion. Not incorporating LGBTQ plus sex ed puts queer students at a disadvantage during a crucial developmental time in our lives. While we cannot completely eradicate these issues with just one action, incorporating LGBTQ plus sex ed into the CHS curriculum is a step in the right direction. Discussing these topics will not only promote safer sexual relationships between queer people as we head into adulthood, but it will also promote LGBTQ plus acceptance amongst our straight peers and thus, and thus reduce bullying and discrimination. This change is necessary to provide a safe, supportive learning environment for our all Clarkston students, regardless of their sexuality or gender identity. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for your comments tonight. Next, we have Samantha Brandon. Hello, my name is Samantha Brandon, um, and my address is 8180 Cotswold Lane, Clarkston, Michigan. Um, hello, my name is Samantha Brandon, and I'm a senior at Clarkston High School, speaking on behalf of the Gay Straight Alliance Club, asking for sexual education in our schools to more deeply educate students about sexual harassment and assault. To start with, teenage people who are assigned female at birth are four times more likely to be victims of sexual assault, rape, or attempted rape, and nearly 70% of all reported sexual assaults occur to children age 17 or under. When students are left uneducated about sexual assault, they don't know what they can do about it after they've been assaulted. And by teaching both what sexual assault is and what students can do about it, students will be more well equipped to deal with, com what, what, with what comes after, and more importantly, they will know how to tell someone what happened. Statistics show that when the victims tell someone, their risk for developing mental health disorders can decrease by up to four times. Teaching what sexual assault is might seem a little redundant or ridiculous to some of you, 
but I can assure you it's really not information that we as a society has made readily available. I experienced sexual assault in middle school and for years I could not identify it for what it was. Even though I was eventually told what my experience was, I still sometimes can't comprehend that it counts, that my experience was valid. If I was old enough then to have experienced sexual assault, I should have been old enough to have learned about it in the classroom. It took me years to be able to tell someone about my experience, and I think if I'd been educated about sexual assault, then I would have been able to get help a lot sooner. Um, and tying back to Morgan, queer people are a lot more likely to be sexually harassed or assaulted than cisgender heterosexual people, so not teaching students about sexual assault and what it is puts a lot of students at risk, but queer students especially. And to finish this up, we cannot gloss over education about sexual assault when students are being taught about sex. In most cases, the victim of sexual assault knows the assaulter, and in a lot of these cases, the assaulter is a family member. Teaching students about sexual assault could give students vital information that they won't be able to receive anywhere else. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your comments. Next, we have Christopher Anastasi. My name is Chris Anastasi, 6151 Pine Knob Road, Clarkston, Michigan. I'm a Clarkston graduate of 2009. Just want to take a moment to address the board, let you guys know uh, the mask mandate when it comes to the students. Uh, it's unacceptable, regardless of where it's coming from, county, state, doesn't matter. It's not going to last either way. If I was a parent and I had students at a Clarkston school, I would simply tell them to just say no. Do not wear a mask. Do not acknowledge those wearing masks. If anybody gets confrontational or physical, physical or harasses you, contact the police, contact your teacher, be respectful, but don't, under any circumstance, wear a mask. Just say no. You guys do not have the power. Ultimately, the families have the power. That's all. All right, thank you for your comments. <laughs> Next on our list is Steve, and I'm sorry, I cannot read your last name. I apologize. Don't worry, guys, Dr. Murray. Thank you. Oh, no worries. Steve Sioma, 5109. Wata Wata. Easier to say, harder to spell. Appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, no worries. So uh, a little bit earlier in this meeting, we said a little something all together. Uh, it was a little weak, I felt. But uh, what was it? One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now, people may have different religions, and I respect that, but the strange thing was how we said it. Do we feel it? Are we just going through the motions? I think that we can all agree on some fundamental principles. One nation, indivisible, not divided. How many people are saying, we will not be divided, we will not divide us? With liberty and justice for all, standing united against oppression, I think that's something that we can all agree on. Now, I could be wrong, but there are certain things, for instance, uh, things that are being taught in schools, things that divide us, things that separate us into identities that have to do with race or character traits, nothing to do with who we are, not who you do. Nobody cares about that. Nobody should care about that. When we are here to teach these kids, and I really do believe that you want to help these kids to succeed, so please help them succeed by equipping them with the tools that they need not all these things dividing them we know what it is we've already been over the last couple of months so please help these kids equip them for the future thank you very much brad McEwen. Mark Green. Steve Whittington. Good afternoon. Again, my name is Stephen Whittington and I live in Deerwood Road in Clarkston, Michigan. I addressed the board last month regarding the overwhelmingly positive experiences my children have had at Independence Elementary. 
I wasn't planning on speaking again tonight, but that changed after I helped my sons sell popcorn for Cub Scouts last weekend. Someone approached us, unprompted, to share completely false accusations about the Clarkston's virtual program. A woman claimed that students were only able to talk to a teacher twice a week and that there was, they were not teaching spelling and literacy in the elementary grades. Now, both of my kids were in virtual last year, so I, I know that this is completely and utterly false, but she believed it. She honestly believed it. She believed it enough to approach us at a popcorn booth and try to convince us to believe her in spite of our personal experiences. Well, I've ref reflected and I've ruminated, and I think I understand a bit more what the teachers and staff at Clarkston are facing right now. There is an organized effort to undermine teachers' authority and ability to do their jobs on the basis of a non-existent critical race theory. This information and bullying of staffs will create low morale, anxiety, high st staff turnover, and more importantly, decreased time available for meaningful education. Clarkson staff is what makes this school system great. They need to be protected and supported. I call on the school board to implement and publicize policies to protect our teachers and staff from harassment and intimidation. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. And finally tonight we had David Dias. Hi, I'm Dave Dias, 5641 uh, Fox Ridge. I'm here to discuss uh, the masks in the schools. Uh, recently, well, actually, I'd like to first start out with the uh, with the budget review, and it was a really insightful to see the revenues that come into the district, which is actually nice to see. We're, at, we're effectively on our own, which enables us to do a lot of things. It also enables us to make our own decisions for our own kids as a community, very close without being beholden to pressures and outside funding pressures, which can drive decision-making processes at your level. <clears throat> With the state, with the new state budget being passed and the provisions being drafted by the new GO, by the GOP legislature, uh, county health officials have dropped their mandates, effectively uh, leaving the decisions for the school districts to make uh, regarding these masks. These masks have to come off of these kids, right? I, I, I personally believe that your decision to fall back on the decision of the county health officials to make this decision for you is rather spineless. I understand you're not doctors, okay? But again, this is a local community. We should make decisions for our kids regarding these masks. So with, with, this new, with the new GOP budget being passed, okay, uh, I, I'm asking this board to readdress and ask the community uh, now that the uh, county health officials have pushed it back to your level to ask us if we want to continue with this, All right? The pressure is now on you. So um, I ask you guys to revisit this, maybe call a special meeting uh, and ask this community if we want to continue with these masks or if we want to eliminate them. That's all. Thank you very much for your comments. We appreciate everyone who stayed tonight. I know it was a long meeting. We had a lot of information. Appreciate everyone who addressed us this evening. Item 10 is information items. Our next Board of Education meeting will be Monday, November 8th at 7 p.m. Stay tuned. I don't know if we'll be back here at the high school. We may return to the board office. Please pay uh, attention to the e-blast system. We will let you know. Item 11 is adjournment. May I have a motion, please? Move to adjourn. Support. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. We are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Good night.